all gimmicked up. Perfect. I love it. It's part of the Art Davy Show. The Art Davy Show. Well, the Art Davy Show converges here a little bit. Uh, welcome to the Clint Cronin Show. Clint, a pleasure to be here. Uh, pleasure's all mine. Pleasure's all mine. Um, a legend. Um, you started something, a little something called the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. The author of Is This Legal? Um, which is uh, essentially a history of the four-year period that went into starting um, what is now the uh, the most popular up-and-coming sport on the planet, possibly the galaxy, because I haven't seen anything bigger than UFC. They haven't shown us what they have on Mars. They might have something. I'm not sure. But what we have right here in this hemisphere is <laughs> quite possibly uh, the, the mo most important or most significant contribution to uh, the sports or the change in professional sports we've had since, oh, since... Since maybe the uh, the the NFL and the the American Football League merged, merged. right? That, since that, since we got Herschel Walker in the NFL, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I think this is bigger because uh, even Herschel Walker wound up fighting in MMA. So. That's right for Donald Trump. <laughs> for Donald Trump, that's true. Who was my roommate at New York Military Academy in 1962 and 1963? I read this. So you are a four year veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. Yes. So. In part of 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 the uh, during your your stay in the Marines was was Donald Trump enlisted as well or no? Okay, so this is your post military uh, training or this was actually a boarding school, a high school. Trump was there starting as I believe an eighth or ninth grader, and I came in as a sophomore in our junior year at this boarding school, New York Military Academy. We were roommates for a semester from September of 62 through January of 63. So I was 15 and Trump was 16. So we were just kids. And um, he was a very successful cadet. He was a, an excellent athlete. He was a three-letter guy. Soccer, football, really wasn't great at football, but baseball, he was the star. He was probably the best thing on the team. And in his senior year, he became the captain of the team. I, I can see that. Um... He's, uh, he's, he's a taller fellow. He looks like he stays in pretty decent shape. He definitely has that type A personality where I, I wouldn't have seen him uh, necessarily as a very introverted uh, fellow back in uh, his – you don't come from uh, you know being an introvert in school, especially in military academy, to being, well, the, the president of the United States of America. <laughs> um, you know, whether you love or hate the guy, if you, if you look at him since the early 80s, he's been on fire. He's been in the public eye. He's been a mainstay in you know pop culture. His name is. He's been a you know probably the answer to a Jeopardy question every year since the, for the last thirty five forty years or something, and now he's a he's the president. So, man, so Donald Trump, and he grew up in Brooklyn, and so I grew up in Brooklyn. Donald grew up in Queens and actually Jamaica States, which was an upscale neighborhood in Queens. Uh, his father, Fred Trump, was very well known in the New York area. In fact, both my grandfathers worked as a carpenter and a house painter for the Trump Organization because they built a ton of homes, Clint, right after World War II for a lot of returning GIs. Fred Trump was a big builder, not even so much in the five boroughs of the city of New York, but in um, uh, Nassau County. Okay. Places like what became Levittown and, yep. and Wine Danch and uh, Mineola. So uh, Trump's family was very successful. And it was only years later when I picked up a book called The 400, which was about the 400 richest families in the United States. And I see the Trump name and I'm going, wow, I didn't realize that Don Trump was that wealthy. Oh, yeah. Growing up on the East Coast, you, you certainly saw the name everywhere. I mean, Atlantic City was 20 minutes from or 30 minutes from the house right down the expressway, you know, the parkway to expressway. Mm -hmm. um, I had one of his earlier autobiographies or biographies. A friend of mine just had it lying around the bathroom and you know, <laughs> I'd see it there. And <clears throat> this is before iPhones and iPads. And so he actually read on the on the can. So I read uh, most of his book, and um, he's had a pretty pretty uh, decorated career. I mean, it was, he basically got his first loan for his first building from his father, who Correct. was a very uh, successful uh, you know landowner, builder, developer. He bought up a lot of properties, you know, tenements and things like that. And now you see things like Trump Towers today, which is essentially an extension of his father's work um, on a much grander scale, obviously. So. Um, 
everybody sees now the the political side and it's it's unfortunate because he's is his contribution uh to to new york to new jersey and it, it was pretty substantial and um you know he's he was a big deal on the east coast he was you know he was a they they had him involved with wrestling. They had, you know they were over in the the Trump uh, I think the casino the Taj Mahal for a few the, for a few of the WrestleManias back in the day. Um, you know, he was he was he was a huge deal to the to people on the East Coast and um, I didn't know anybody didn't like the guy. Was, when when you look at his career, I think one of the most significant things is that uh, like Ronald Reagan was an actor who transitioned to politics. Trump was a reality star for a very successful franchise that he partnered with Mark Burnett, The Apprentice. So you're talking about 16 seasons on TV. As great as Trump was at manipulating the media when he was a celebrity figure as a builder and hotel manager, owner in New York, New Jersey, he became even bigger and more media savvy as a reality star. So you're looking at a guy who really understands how to uh, zero in on the public's interests and passions and to address them. So his early involvement with the WWE or promoting a boxing match that Tyson may have been in uh, is only one of the few steps on the road to becoming a real media savvy, smart guy. I feel like he's always been fairly current in terms of just having his ear to the ground and being connected to sort of the next big thing, having the wherewithal to sort of transition from what he was doing with, I mean, obviously Miss Universe is, is a huge, very successful franchise. And, um, but then he did attach himself to reality TV and push himself to being one of the <laughs> biggest reality TV properties, um, in a very congested, uh, industry. Uh, you have the Kardashians, you have uh, the real world, which would have been the real kickoff of that. You had the ultimate fighter, which is the first real athletic competition, which stemmed from the UFC. And then to be able to come out and build something like the apprentice and put himself over as the star of that in a sea of, you know, the, it was mostly, it was all celebrities on the apprentice, right? Yes. Cause they had the celebrity apprentice and yes. he was still the star. He came out with a catchphrase. He, he took the you're fired and that's more iconic than Vince McMahon's you're fired. Who's been doing it 10 years yes. earlier. So he's uh he's, he's done a lot. And um, I, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that things are going to get a little bit better before they get worse in terms of the presidency. I'm not the, uh, the most political guy when it comes to doing these things. I like to, avoid divisive uh, sides of uh, arguments. I think there's enough of that in the world. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to put something together and uh, come out a little bit better. I, if I'm going to look at the positive side of it, it's where uh, our relation with Russia might go. If we're able to improve that, that's already a win. If that actually happens, if the, if the talks continue and we can avoid a deeper, you know, sort of cold war, I'm I'm happy. That's good. Um, you know, we have a lot of Russian people in the country that may not be too thrilled on going home to visit. And you know, if we can do that, you know, what what we're doing, you know, in terms of working with Cuba, maybe it's good. What the hell do I know? I do jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> so you're uh, you're actually a Brazilian jujitsu blue belt dating back to the early '90s. Is this is this, uh, this is uh, yes. wow? And so you wound up approaching. Corian and the Hickson and the Gracie family in the very early nineties with this idea to have the, uh, the, the best fighter, basically the street fighter uh, or blood sport video game <laughs> to take style versus style and just fighter versus fighter and just figure out who is the best in the world. What's the best style in the world? How was this received by the Gracie's uh, initially when you, when you brought it to them? Uh, I was ignored, uh, basically, by Horion for about a year and a half. Uh, very friendly, very affable, great teacher, by the way, with great social skills, great jujitsu skills. But he had been approached by so many people, Clint, about doing something with the Gracie Challenge. Now, the Gracie Challenge was this $100,000 winner-take-all that he had come up with. And quite frankly, nobody had ever come up with 100000 and quite frankly, Horian at the time didn't have 100000 So it had gotten him a magazine article by Pat Jordan in the September 89 issue of Playboy. In fact, that's where I discovered the Gracie family. Because at the time, I was working for an ad agency. Um, and my boss's clients, 
uh, were looking for some new ideas. And my boss brought me into a couple of meetings and wanted me to see if I could come up with some crazy spitball ideas. One of them was for something that I called the world's best fighter. I'd been thinking about this since I had been in the Marines. I enlisted in 66, got out in 70, served in the Pentagon, served 11 months, nine days in the Republic of Vietnam. And back in the day, Clint, guys would sit around, jarheads would sit around and talk, talk smack about, could Bruce Lee have beaten Muhammad Ali? What would happen if Sugar Ray Robinson fought, you know, Chuck Norris? And uh, there was always this great debate, you know, about the martial arts. I had been turned on to Taekwondo when I was in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon. A young corporal named Ron Butcher brought me over to June Ree School, and I found out I wasn't the most flexible guy in the world, <laughs> uh, hip-wise and leg-wise. But I had done a little boxing when I was back as a kid in Brooklyn, a Catholic youth organization, and I was fascinated by this idea. So when back in the late 80s now, when my boss brought me in, in this ad agency to some of his clients... I ran this world's best fighter idea by one of them in particular. It was a beer importer. They brought a lot of Mexican beer into the United States for a fairly young Hispanic and Asian uh, clientele. Um, and quite frankly, they thought, yeah, it's cra crazy and wild, but wow, it could be very expensive and it'll probably be pretty illegal. So it got passed on. On the other hand, I wound up with a file folder full of information about uh, the martial arts in America, who, if anybody, had been doing any kind of mixed match bouts. In fact, what was the history of mixed match fighting? So I had done my homework, Clint, on things like uh, Gene LaBelle versus Milo Savage in 63. What is it? Wasn't it uh, Muhammad Ali against... And uh, Antonio Inoki, Inoki, Inoki in 76. Gene LaBelle was the referee for that. Yep. Now... I read this article, Clint, in Playboy. Uh, my secretary, Joy, at the aid agency had pulled the article for me. On uh, At that time, there was no internet, but you could go down to the Torrance Public Library and pull these things up in, yeah. the, in the files. And at the same time, I began doing a lot of research on pay-per-view because while I had heard from Horion that a lot of people had said, let's do a video, you know, we'll have your brother Hickson out at the beach fighting a kick fighter or a taekwondo guy, and we'll, we'll tape it and we'll sell it at Blockbuster. I myself thought and knew that the Blockbuster formula was coming to an end. Brick and mortar video stores were, in a sense, on their way out. Uh, and I was fascinated by pay-per-view. So I had two original ideas. One was a tournament. Three fights in one night, a single elimination tournament. I looked up all these other sports that did these elimination tournaments, things in golf and so forth, and I thought, this is cool. So... Those were my two ideas, pay-per-view and a tournament. So I had been coming and talking to Horion on and off for a year, year and a half. My class was on Tuesday night. The guy who had a class right after me was film director and screenwriter John Milius. Nice. The legendary John Milius. And John and I, you know, were a pretty close in age and John wanted to be in the Marine Corps which I had been in for four years but John had problem with asthma and was never able to enlist so John and I sometimes would hang out in Horion's office after the class so we'd go to the juice bar first pick up a smoothie and we'd sit down and we'd talk smack about fighters warfare the military and so forth and then one night I ran this idea uh, by Horion about you know the world's best fighter and Horian, you know, thought, well, it could be interesting, but I could tell it just didn't, just didn't seem to catch his attention. So what I did over that Christmas holiday, I said, let's sell your videos. He said, well, I'm selling them right now. I got a little ad in Black Belt Magazine. You know, we're selling the basics of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This was his first series, Clint, on, you know, instructional videos. I said, no, no, no. I know how to do a direct mail campaign. The agency that I was working for, virtually within walking distance of the Gracie Academy, was the Creative Direct Marketing Group. And they did work for Howard Rush. They did work for uh, some of the best um, mail order people in the country, including like even Citibank on their credit cards. So I was selling for as a package fifteen, twenty thousand dollar $20,000 ad campaigns to do a direct mail campaign. I said to Horian, I'm going to do it for you for nothing. All you got to do is pay for the printing. 
He said, uh, how does that work? I said, well, you know, I explained it to him. He, they didn't do things like that down in Rio de Janeiro. No, no, no. Right? So bottom line, we did a mailing. And in six weeks, it brought in 150000 U.S. dollars. And suddenly, I had Horion Gracie's attention big time. Nice. When I walked in his office after that, he said, what else are we going to do? <laughs> I said, we're going to do all kinds of stuff. I said, but from now on, ain't no more freebies. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, this one was a freebie. I needed to catch your attention. From now on, we got to make a deal. He had never done business where he paid anybody the kind of commission that I proposed. I think I wanted 30%. We settled on 22 and a half off the top. Oh. So he had never done that. But I said to him, now we're going to do the world's best fighter. He said, how are we going to do it? I said, we're going to set up a corporation. I said, we're going to do an LLC. I had done my homework, Clint, found out that Colorado had a loophole in their law that allowed bare knuckle fighting. Nice. And they also were one of the three states in the US of A that had the LLC, the limited liability company. In Colorado, they was using it to protect you know, gas and oil drillers. Guy put in $10,000, if the well blew up, you only vulnerable as in a lawsuit to the 10,000. So I figured for a fighting show, you know, if we might, God forbid we've had any injuries and so forth, this was a good way to do it. So Horian and I decided to form a partnership. I went up to Colorado. I incorporated. I got us an accountant. I got us an attorney. And uh, as I say in my book, Is This Legal?, I uh, brought my Glock 17 <laughs> <laughs> up there at the time and uh, put it in the safe deposit box. And, um, I, and I actually recruited Pat Smith up there for the first time, who was the Savaki Challenge winner of Bare Knuckle Karate Tournament. Nice. And I said to Orion, who are we going to put in from your family in the tournament? I said, shouldn't it be Hickson? 4,000 wins, zero losses, right? right? That's that's what, you know. That's the legend, right? It's Hickson. Yeah. I remember going to exercise classes that he would run at about 6.30 on a certain weekday morning. A lot of cops were in that class. In fact, big John McCarthy used to show up in that class. Cool guy. Cool guy. In fact, John and I were blue belts about the same time. So interestingly enough, in this class, he was doing things like one-legged squats. And you, after a while, after 20 minutes, I would burn out, and I, I wasn't alone. I remember Bob Augustine, who was a lieutenant in the Torrance Police Department, looked over at me once, and he said, I'm leaving. You going too? We both booked. The classes were too intense. Hickson was a jaguar. He was the human jaguar. Oh, yeah. He was unbelievable physically. Oh, yeah. He's, he's a he, the big proponent of that gymnastica natural. And um, for people that haven't seen that before, it's it's like almost acrobatics plus yoga plus calisthenics yes. plus just positions and they they work the rings they work all balance beam and contort they have the the breathing thing the yoga fire breath or whatever yep. it's called yeah just pistol squats are hard everything <laughs> everything about him was off the wall and incredible he'd walk into a room and everybody would stop and just look I, in fact i said in my book is this legal he was like a cross between mike tyson and antonio banderas yep he was a good looking uh a jaguar and uh i assumed it was going to be him and there had been a little friction between he and horion there was some family history about maybe some of the students were ending up over at uh, hickson's garage and this, you know, Horion had, had borrowed a lot of money to complete the school. When I first met Horion, they were just at the process of switching over Clint from the garage where they were teaching students in Redondo Beach, Horion's garage, at his house. And they were just moving everybody over to this new facility over on Carson Street. In fact, as I tell the story in the book, Is This Legal? When I came in to meet him and we had that first conversation that first night, he had a bunch of blue cards on his table. He was switching over the old Rolodex cards to these new blue membership cards. And he had asked me if I had ever done anything like you did. So, you know, did you ever wrestle art? I said, no. I did a little boxing. So he invited me to roll. And I came back that next night and rolled. And I was stunned by what I, what I felt and saw. I thought, this is unbelievable. And as I tell the story in the book, Is This Legal? I had been taken down on, at the beach out in Southampton, Peconic Bay, back in 65, by a friend of mine's buddy who was a wrestler. We were jabbing and joking, juking around, and he said, well, I heard you might be doing golden gloves, and I won the, I came in third in the state championships in the 70 kilo, 
So before you know it, I was throwing jabs and he took me down on the sand and I had to tap out. So I knew from the article and from my own experience, Clint, that I was lost on the ground. So I was blown away by Horion. When we sat down after that class, Horion said, you want to take some lessons? I said, yep, I'm in. He actually pulled one of the blue cards across. I became student number one. Wow. At the academy. So I always assumed it was going to be Hickson all summer long. And uh, I'd heard though from Horion that maybe Hickson was pinching some of the students out of the school and kind of teaching them privately over at his house. So about oh, late July, I finally pinned Horion down. I said, look, I've already signed up uh, uh, Kevin Rozier. I've signed up Pat Smith. Uh, we'd already made a couple of uh, uh, you know selections for this eight-man tournament, Clint. And he finally said to me, it's going to be Hoyce. I said, Hoyce? Your kid brother? He sweeps up the school. He doesn't have a credit card or a driver's license. He lives in a little room above your garage. (laughs) He's just a big kid. He's like 28 going on 18. I remember on a Saturday afternoon, he'd show up inside of Horian's office. I'd be in there talking to Horian at that point because I was making the money now. And Hoyce would look at Horian, just kind of stand there with his hands in front of his, in his lap, kind of hope, just standing there, just kind of looking sheepish. Finally, Horian would say, you want some money? And he'd open up the safe and give Hoist three 20s. And Hoist was going to go out at the beach. He was going to thumb a ride out to the beach, hang out, do a little surf and flirt with the girls and get something to eat. Wow. He's just a big kid. So I was stunned when he said to me, we're going to put Hoist in this tournament. I said, Horian, you agree. It's three fights in one night. He said, ain't no problem. He said, Hoist will do it. And who was going to train Hoist was Hickson. That's right. That's who uh, took him out. It was uh, Elio. It was Hickson. Uh, was I don't, did Horian come out to the to the, the cage with him? I don't, no, Horian. I don't Horian and I, I. I took Horian down to uh, over at the mall on Hawthorne Boulevard. We went and got tuxedos together. So we was all going to be dressed up in tuxedos that night. <laughs> but the train which you're referring to, which brought Hoyce out to the ring, became a real signature for the Gracies. It was Hoyler. It was uh, yep. Holker. It was Hobbin. It was uh, Helson from Hawaii. Yep. The brothers. And I got to tell you. Nobody prepared a uh, hoist better than Hickson could. In fact, the story is often told that in UFC 3, when Hoist had had that tough, incredible victory over a 263-pound, you know, Chemo Leopoldo, and he's back in the dressing room and he's really gassed. He's emotionally and physically drained. The truth of the matter is, is that that was the show that Hickson wasn't in his corner. UFC 1 and 2 Hickson was there, but by UFC 3, Hickson was no longer linebacking Hoist Gracie, and Hoist didn't have Hickson's spine that night in his back. And in all fairness, when he came out to the octagon, he was already seeing spots in front of his eyes. He turned to his father, he turned to to Horion, and he said, I can't go. And they had to throw the towel in the ring. Harold Howard was standing there, and he said, they threw the towel. It's a victory for me. He's already here. This isn't a bye. He's already, he's here. He threw the towel. He came into the the octagon. So that was an incredible moment. And it proved to what extent Hickson had been a real power to to provide Hoist with the kind of emotional energy. The greatest night, in a way, for Hoist was when he won at UFC 4 in Tulsa because he did it on his own against a wrestler that I brought in, Dan Severin. That's right. In a 14-minute bout that actually ran overtime. Without Hickson in his corner, Hoist dominated that night he prevailed and i remember i lost it that night emotionally standing inside the octagon when he won and his brothers hoisted him on his shoulder i was so overcome there's actually a shot of me coming over grabbing hoist's hand pulling it to my face and kissing it i i looked at it later on and said what did i do was that me i was so (laughs) thrilled for him that night because i knew how much pressure there was on him to win without hickson there to be behind him these have obviously been the most formative experiences of his life because when you see Hoist now, the uh, the way he carries himself is is a lot the same way you would see his his, his you know his father carry himself, see Hickson carry himself. He's very he, he's got a great sense of humor, but he has like a very serious like very uh, sort of composed demeanor now. Yes, he's he's he's, a, he's very much a different person than when you would have obviously seen him twenty something years ago. Oh man, it's been that long. He he really wow. uh, the, the entire process of his three victories, uh, and I remember after UFC five, Horian and I brought a samurai sword 
uh, from a collector in Japan, and we had the three UFC logos from the three shows where he had dominated and won the three tournaments and presented it to him. And those three victories solidified Hoist emotionally, psychologically, and physically. He was no longer in Hicks and Shatter. He was his own man. And like you say, today, the kind of assurance, confidence that he has, it's born of that legendary experience he had. He was the great pioneer, and he was a leopard among lions. He, I don't think Hoist at the back in the day, Clint, ever weighed much more than 177 pounds soaking wet. That's really funny you say that. I saw him last week, um, <laughs> and he eats well. I mean, in terms of Gracie diet, he, you know, he, he follows it, but, you know, he's, he's not afraid of a little chicken Parmesan. You know, he, he likes the Italian food. Yes, he does. 178 pounds. Yes. That's the exact weight. <laughs> if you ask him any day of the week, what is his weight? Yeah. Hoist Gracie will come to you and say 178 pounds. Yeah. Uh, it's what he told me last week. And it's what he told me six months ago. Yep. He doesn't stray. He says 178, no matter what he does. And he'll r go run it off. He'll, whatever he eats, he's going to go run 10 miles. That's that. That's just Hoist. He's a. Yes. He's very much a product of that upbringing, and uh, just what what is it? Uh, Sports Illustrated. I just read this the other day. Um, they he, they rank him as in somewhere in the. I don't I don't know the exact rank, but somewhere in the top fifty most influential sportsmen ever. Mm. Just the top fifty most influential or most uh, significant athletes in history, and uh, that MMA is represented there. That the UFC is represented there is it's pretty amazing. Um, considering that a, a new sport was able to sort of break ground and make its way into the mainstream because a lot don't. It's almost like Tesla being able to get in there and compete with Ford and Chevy and Toyota and that people actually know what the hell a Tesla is. Right. It, it's insane, right? Look at the juggernauts you're competing against and that a, a kid from Brooklyn <laughs> can wind up at the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Gracie's house and, then go up to Colorado and get a business license with his Glock 17, and you know get the insurance thing, and get the uh, get the, the 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 accountant and all this stuff, and show up and get a venue and send out mailers. The thing that was very interesting to me in direct mail, um, a lot of people that watch the UFC don't even know what the hell this is. They look, everything that comes in the mail now, they're like junk, 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 because it's everything's electronic. It's a totally different world. But back then. The Sears catalog was, this was like the Bible when it came like almost the holiday season. You're like, I really looked at Sears catalog because that's that was Christmas. That's that right. was whatever, right? But then magazines, um, for me, I found out about the UFC because I, I knew Ken Shamrock from the pro wrestling days. We used to trade those. So I was a pro wrestling fan, like the the, the really nerdy one. We had the dirt sheets, like Dave Meltzer. There was oh, right. The, oh, and we would the trade. The Wrestling Observer. We had the Wrestling Observer. We sure. had Pro Wrestling Illustrated. There was a couple of them where we would trade them. And uh, he had one guy, you know, he, had a, he had the copy machine in like his dad's office. And everybody would make the copies. You sell them for a dollar in the school. And like, I did the intramural wrestling. I did Taekwondo and all this stuff but way back. I was, I was a little kid and I knew who Ken Shamrock was from, I think it was like the UWF. He, and then he did Pancrase, which I knew because of these guys and you sort of would see the different promotions. You're like, well, what the hell is that? That doesn't look like it's the same thing. We'd trade tapes and, sh and stuff. So I saw Pancrase and uh, that was, that was different. I wasn't really sure what the heck I was watching. And then <clears throat> I think I remember black belt magazine is the first place that had the ads for the ultimate fighting championship or ultimate fighting challenge. I don't, I don't, I don't recall if it was called the same thing in one of the ads or how they described it, but it was a, uh, it, it, it was basically what you were, what you were building. And it was a few months out and uh, there was always a kid in the neighborhood that, that somehow got all the pay-per-views on the, the uh, scientific Atlanta box. I don't know how they did that. I so <laughs> probably bought all of them legitimately. Of so course. I might owe you 30 bucks. Sorry. <laughs> I was a minor. I was just watching. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, you know, you'd watch like uh, whatever the WWF was at the time. And then if there would be a boxing fight, they, they, everybody always got the boxing matches. It was, it was what you did. Um, remember, I remember watching on, I think it was on HBO. It was the, uh, the Holy field, not Holy film. Sorry. Mike Tyson, uh, Buster Douglas. Hmm. And Japan. It was in Japan in the middle of the night. I was allowed to stay up. And uh, I'm like, oh, this Mike Tyson guy. All right, I'll watch the Mike Tyson thing. And he got knocked. They were like, what are you? All right. Now we have YouTube. You can go back and see right. that he did very well before that. But sure. yeah, at the time, um, sitting there and watching the first three Ultimate Fighting Championships at my friend's house, 
Um, they made us, you know, we were you know, kids. I think the, the parents were a little bit more strict on some stuff. When, so when there was a little bit of blood, and I think uh, chemo, or I think it was chemo, got his ponytail a little bit uh, pulled out. Chemo. That was Hoist, right? Hoist did it to him. He had a, he had a handful of that thing. and right. uh, It's like a gi, I suppose. You can, <laughs> it's a handle. It's, the rules have changed a little bit, but yes. uh, yeah, we had to leave room for that. And uh, I think there was also a, a kick to the face with a, a shattered tooth that we had to probably – leave the room for but UFC one yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> but um I, I think the the biggest shock was ken shamrock dropping down to go for a footlock and hoist grace is just getting up and strangling him with his jacket yes and that changed everything for me it changed everything for ken shamrock oh yeah oh, he yeah. spent the next 20 years <laughs> defending those learning <laughs> those yes so. and uh and and being and being haunted by that uh, that first match that first bout I feel terrible about the way the third fight went for him. Yes. It, it was unfortunate. Um, it, it, but at, at this stage, it's the refereeing. The, 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 it's, 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 it's difficult at this main event. I, I see a lot of them. They're not watching or they miss something. And I've, I've been in matches myself where I, I've tapped the guy and they just said, no, I didn't tap. And then just carries on and come on. So that's, that, that job sucks. Refereeing those matches. That's a tough, it's a tough ref. Oh, I, yeah. I, I've got the, the certificate from two different jiu-jitsu organizations that says I can be a referee. It's required as a black belt. We have to do CPR. We got to do that thing. We got to do a background check. The whole, and you got to pay up the wazoo just to compete at black belt. Now it's right. like $435. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Uh-huh. And you got to pay for all that other stuff. Like the course is like $67 a piece. CPR wow. too. Wow. Um, so I know the rules. I'm just never doing that job. <laughs> it's, a ter- it's a terrible, it's a thankless job. It is. You couldn't pay me enough. And John McCarthy's like the only one that came out unscathed. John is a, a incredible guy. Uh, for the first UFC, uh, we, we debated, and it's in the book, uh, is this legal? We debated about who could we have referee this thing? It, nobody had ever quite done this before. And I talk, and I've done interviews about it. You know, back in the day, there was a guy named Frank Dukes who used to claim that he was champion of some world kumite thing that took place in the caribbean and i could never quite track down any real information about it in fact i think i still have an article from the uh uh from the uh, la times uh back in 88 so i i didn't really uh know whether or not he was real um but i did know that gene labelle was real and horian knew him quite well they had actually met and interacted on the set of the tv show called heart to heart the uh, Robert Wagner vehicle, and um, Stephanie Powers. And um, I said, what about, you know, Gene LaBelle? And I knew that he had refereed the Antonio Inoki, uh, Muhammad Ali mixed match in Japan in 76. And um, Horian was kind of uh, not negative, but he wasn't real positive about Gene. So... uh, I could never get a real answer. In fact, it was years later that he finally gave me the whole story. But he then said, why don't we bring in some, um, some Valley Tudo referees from Brazil? I said, great. I said, that makes sense. I said, give me some suggestions. So he mentioned um, uh, Joao Bejeto. He mentioned Elio Vigio. And Elio Vigio had a formidable reputation. He had been the chief of police, Rio de Janeiro. I'd heard some very interesting stories about him. But both of those gentlemen, Clint, did not speak any English. And interestingly enough, Joao Bejeto kind of came to our show, UFC 1, with somewhat of an agenda. He had been trying to promote a much more rule-based uh, event in, in Rio called La Lute Livre American. And uh, we went over. I made sure that Horian really ran that referee meeting with them because it had to be in Portuguese, what the rules were. And basically, the rules for the first event were no biting, no eye gouging, basically, you know. And the referee could not stop the bout. So in the first bout, when Gerard Godot from the Netherlands kicked Taylor Tooley, the sumo wrestler from Hawaii, in the face, and one of his teeth got sheared off at the gum and went sailing over the heads of my sponsors from Gold's Gym, Pete and Paul Grimkowski and their wives— uh, Joao Bejeto stops, steps in and stops the bout. We were all stunned. So to make a long story short, after the first UFC, Horian and I got into a big discussion about 
what are we going to do? And he agreed with me, no more Brazilians. It was really the language issue more than anything else. And as I say, Joao Bajeto's insistence on imposing rules where there were none was a violation of not only our mandate to him, but the spirit of the event. So I turned it to, uh, uh, to, to Horian and said, you got any suggestions? He said, what do you think about John? I said, John McCarthy? I, he said, yeah. And I knew John from, from school, from the Gracie Academy. John and I were actually roughly blue belts at about the same time. John's father was a legendary figure in the Los Angeles Police Department. Oh, yeah. Yep. He had been instrumental in either founding their SWAT team operation or in, in uh, developing it. And John grew up in his shadow. John was a tough street cop. And, you know, John was also an incredible power lifter. I think at one point, John had a 750-pound squat, a 700-and-something-pound deadlift, and a 475-pound bench press at 280. So John was incredibly strong, uh, had a, a real, real command presence about him, the kind of guy on the street who said, keep your hands on the steering wheel. You kept your hands on the steering wheel. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? So John came in, and uh, now the interesting story, which John tells today better than I do, is that... The WOW office on 1616 Gramercy Street in Torrance was literally within short walking distance of the back of the Gracie Academy. It was just around the corner. And uh, so John sometimes would come over with his son, come over to the WOW office and say, hey, Art, what are you doing? Who have you signed up? He was, a, he was, he was like a big fan and, and one, of my biggest, one of my biggest supporters. So when we selected him as the referee, John and I got closer because – a lot of times, John was the guy that I would go to, and I would say, John, I'm thinking of doing this, thinking of adding this as a rule evolution. What do you think? And John would say, no, that, all right, that's bogus. Don't do that. So John was my linebacker on, on the rules and on refereeing, and John immediately came in and did a great job. I began to call John, and John gives me credit in his book. Let's get it on. John says, my mother, when I was a kid, called me Big John because I was very big even as a baby. But he said it was Art who started to call me Big John and got all the announcers to use it. And he said it just stuck. And I was, uh, John says, I was unsure about how I should start the match. And it was Art and I sitting around one day over at the WOW office. And, we, and I think it was Art, but I, I'll be honest with you, Clint. I think that Big John came up with Let's Get It On. To be real thing. But it, it came about, I guess, sitting over at the WOW office one day. John would always come over and say to me, who are you putting in? And I remember when I brought Tank Abbott and he said, this guy ain't no martial artist. He's a thug. I said, that's exactly why I want him in this event, John. I said, he's the big biker bad boy that all them karate black belts say that they can kick his butt. I said, let's put him in. You know, so John was always, you know, uh, John used to tease me and say, well, you know, are you a little guy? So you like to bring in these big giants. I say, John, it's an, uh, an open weight class event. And I said, I've got freedom. I said to bring in, you know, a 600 pound sumo wrestler as well as a 200 pound Kempo guy. And that was the exciting and a great part of the early events, Clint, was that, in fact, we could do anything. We could bring anybody in. And as soon as we started to get popular, now it wasn't even running those ads that you were talking about in Black Belt, Inside Karate, and Inside Kung Fu. Now I would come to the WOW office at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, and somebody would be asleep on my doorstep. That's how I met Oleg Taktorov. Oh, wow. I came there Monday morning, and this guy is sleeping in my doorway. And I tapped him, and I said, can I help you? He didn't speak any English. Okay. He was living in his car, and he didn't speak any English. He only spoke Russian. Yeah, who helped with the Russian? I was about to so say. So I bring him in my office, and we're kind of communicating by hand signals. Now, my brother-in-law, Alex Mitkovich, there you go. Is uh, we were both in the Marines almost at the same time. He got out as a captain. I got out as a sergeant. And after the the Marines, he went in and became an officer for 26 years in the Carlsbad Police Department in North San Diego County. So I called my brother-in-law up on the phone. I said, Alex, I got somebody here who's speaking Russian or Ukrainian. I can't understand a word he says. So I put Oleg on. And afterwards, Oleg says to my brother-in-law, I thought Art was, was, was Russian. Is he Italian? He, doesn't, he couldn't figure out why I've got a Russian brother-in-law or a brother. I introduced him, I think, as my brother. And Oleg handed me a video, and it was him teaching Spetsnaz guys in Russia and some, some unauthorized bouts, some really rough Sambo stuff and some street stuff. 
And I turned around and I said to my brother-in-law, translate for me. I'm going to send him over to the academy, which was only 25 yards away. I called up Horian and I said, I got a guy I want you to test. Horian says, okay, send him over. So I sent him over. I told him, I, I took him out to the corner and I pointed to the back of the Gracie Academy. I said, go, that door. I had, I had gotten the word for door from my brother-in-law. I pointed to, the, I said door, whatever the word was in Russian. And he went over there and knocked on it. They let him in and they had him roll with Lloyd, one of the brown belts. Two hours later, I called Horian up. I said, hey, what happened to that kid? Oh yeah, we rolled with him. He's, uh, he's pretty good. He's all right. I said, well, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, he's kind of a footlock guy. Really? Yeah, you know, Lloyd uh, made him, you know, I said, well, wait, wait, is he really good? I'm not that excited about him. I figured if they're, they're saying that to me, I'm going to put him in the next UFC. Because <laughs> I, I found out in my own research, Clint, that the Gracies came from a universe where uh, the, all the, the things from Sambo, the footlocks, the ankle locks were known as suburban techniques kind of middle classy thing they didn't like it well let, let's let's think about it this way so when mitsumaida and all of uh, you know the, the the japanese you know well the, the colonists let's call it that came to brazil they met with uh carlos um gastal gracie uh you know and elio elio was obviously much younger then right uh, right and they made whatever sort of business deals they made and mm -hmm. part of the bill of goods included uh, chokes Arm locks, shoulder locks. Yes. But it didn't include leg locks. That's right. It just wasn't there. Um, it's not that judo didn't have it. It's just that it wasn't a, a strong suit of that art. However, there are others that like the catch wrestling, the British guys, the Americans, and obviously the Sambo, the Sambas, they all had this stuff. It's just it, it wasn't part of the bill of goods that the Japanese brought to Brazil. Fast forward now with the evolution of jujitsu now, <clears throat> if you compete in gi jujitsu, right? The people that attend these events, unfortunately are, and I'm, I'm a black belt, I can say this, it's the people that are competing, their friends, their family, their teammates, their training partners, and uh, maybe a couple diehard fans, which there aren't a lot of because gi jujitsu isn't a spectator sport because of the rules, because of the, the speed, but really you can game the rules just like they do in the UFC where they put their hand on the ground so you don't get kneed in the mouth, right? You can game rules no matter, as soon as you go from no holds barred, don't uh, go for groin shots or you know biting or finger, whatever, once you have a set of rules, obviously there's going to be an incentive to game them. So that's if we have established that the number of people that are going to attend a gi jiu-jitsu event are going to be just those people that we mentioned, right? A relatively small group. Small market. Yeah, a niche crowd to say the least, mm -hmm. right? And then we watch the UFC in modern times, right? And then you have uh, all these uh, Tokinho, the Husumar Payadas with the, the leg locks, right? Or you, you see uh, somebody uh, you know gets a choke in 28 seconds. And then all of a sudden, these are they have what? UFC Fight Pass now, which is a subscribe on demand online service that works on any device, including a watch, I think. There's probably a watch that plays it. My car has it. Right. My car actually has UFC Fight Pass. Right. Like that's a real thing. It's not that safe, but you can do it. <laughs> um, as soon as something like that comes on the TV, part of their offering now is something called EBI, which is Eddie Bravo and Invitational. I know Eddie very well. He's awesome. I, I trained with him a few a uh, few months ago, and I, sp I spent an hour talking to him. He's uh, I love the guy. He's a, he's an incredible character. He's also the guy that uh, has both a draw and a victory over Hoyle Gracie. Oh, he does. He does. <laughs> These are both amazing matches, one in Brazil and then one in uh, Metamoris, right. which is uh, Halleck Gracie's. Yes, uh, Halleck's event. <laughs> so in, if you have a UFC Fight Pass and say the subscriber count is, uh, say, say they've got 2 million subscribers, say they at least can claim the same number that Vince McMahon has on the WWE Network. Let's say it's close. A little bit less? Okay. A little bit less but probably more than the people that are just going to go and do a gi jiu-jitsu tournament because I know how many people go watch when I'm competing and they I know them all they've probably mostly have been to my house for dinner. <laughs> I don't have that big of a kitchen art. <laughs> now, if someone sees a submission and it says click here for more things like that and I click EBI and it's like, "Hey, wait, they're dressed kind of the same. Well, they're built kind of the same. It's no gi, so it's moving a little faster." Well, wait a minute. They can do leg locks, but wait, you, why, why? Oh, 
So which one is going to matter in five years if Brazilian jiu-jitsu does not adapt and add, because they are, you can do straight ankle locks as a white belt now. It, it, you can, but just you can't do the heel hooks, the knee bars, are, it's like, oh, you have to be this certain belt and the ankle lock, where you, the, the toe hold and all that, you have to be a certain belt. And then the, the, the biggest detraction, detraction is, they, well, it's dangerous. Yeah, so is CrossFit. If you don't have a good instructor and they're not teaching people, lots of stuff's dangerous. Scissors are terribly dangerous if you don't know what the hell to do with them. But if you have an educated uh, use group, user group that understands how to defend them first, how to recognize you're in trouble, well, you know you're in a heel hook. You're like, oh, man, my pride or walking. You tap. I don't, my, my arms are fine right now. I'm a little sore in the morning, but eh, who's not sore? You know, you know what I mean? So I, I feel like in five years, if Gi Jiu Jitsu doesn't follow what obviously has <clears throat> a much larger uh, audience, they're going to be experiencing the same thing that Ken Shamrock's experienced because victory through obscurity, it's still victory. <laughs> right. He still won. He still got his right. hand raised in his pajamas right. on television. Right. And the big 215 pound guy with the six pack was like, what the hell? And spent 20 years like we just talked <laughs> right. about. Right. 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 So the, it's, it, it's obscure victory through obscurity. It's still victory. The, the funny story on Ken Shamrock was that, uh, uh, I had ads in the, you know, when we first did the ads uh, in the magazines for the UFC, I think it was under the original, one of the original working titles was War of the Worlds. And I talk about that in the book. That's cool. It went from World's <clears throat> Best Fighter to War of the Worlds to the UFC. And uh, I get a call from a Scott Bissac okay. from the Lion's Den, and he wants to apply to go into the UFC. It might have been like UFC 2. Or, or, it was before UFC 1, obviously. And uh, we got talking, and he said to me, uh, Mr. Davey, he said, you know, the more I talk to you, the more I realize it really ought to be my teacher and coach. It really ought to be my teacher and coach, Ken Wayne Shamrock. I love that name, Ken Wayne Shamrock. I thought, wow, I like the sound of that already. So he starts to tell me about Ken. And uh, I said, great, send me some stuff. Uh, let me talk to Ken at some point. Uh, Ken was in and out of Japan because right before we started the UFC, Pancrase started in Japan. And um, um, at one point, I finally got Ken on the phone. And I remember his first conversation with me he said, is this a work or a shoot? I said, this is a shoot, for real. I said, Ken, I'm getting the feeling about what you're doing in Japan. It's sort of a semi-work. Well, he says, you know, uh, some of it's choreographed, but look, a lot of it goes to the bottom line and we, you know, get to do what we really do. I said, well, let me confirm for you, this is a shoot, 100%. Now, Ken actually flies in to the first UFC. We signed him. I signed him. And he comes in on Tuesday. All the other fighters that come in on Monday. He had to come in from Fukuoka in Japan. He was, uh, he was coming in off a show they did on Saturday. I said, can you do this and be ready? Oh, don't worry, Art. I'll, I'll be fine. So he gets in. I barely saw him on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I run into him. He's heading over to the gym. We had had uh, a powerhouse gym owned by my cousin in Denver, interestingly enough, um, and a, a Gold's gym available. And I run into Ken, and he says to me, so Art, is this a shoot? I said, Ken, we've been all through this. It's a shoot. He said, Art, there's some guy here in karate pajamas. <laughs> he said, I just know he's never had a pro fight. He's talking about Hoist, of course. And I said, Ken, trust me, this is the real thing. You're going to see it on Friday night, blah, blah, blah. I'm glad you're right. He said, don't worry about it. He said, I'll bring my game. He said, but the kid in karate pajamas, he said, he belongs in a school, you know, in a dojo someplace. I said, all right. So that's the irony of my first hookup with Ken. But look, he became a big star for me and for the early UFC. He later became as big a star, maybe bigger, uh, when Zufa bought it in 2001. First Hall of Famer, <clears throat> I was at uh, UFC 40 Live, uh, Vendetta. So his first match with Tito Ortiz coming off of uh, Guy Mesker. Um, I spent some time with a few years ago. I went to um, the UFC fight in San Jose, the, the real bloodbath with Shogun and Dan Henderson. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Vanderlei Silva with Kung Lee, it was, it was like, it was legit, legitimately blood sport for the, you know, the, the 2010s. So I said, I watched the fights with Guy Mesker and very cool guy, still not a big fan of Vanderlei Silva after all these years working with him in pride. But, um, I met Vanderlei too. Vanderlei couldn't have been nicer. It couldn't have been more, you know, more humble or a you know, gentleman, very funny, good sense of humor. Um, 
I'm a big fan of Ken. I love Ken. Um, I, I, I know Frank very well. I spent time with him. Uh, he's, he was my first guest on this thing a year or so ago. Uh, we went to a soccer game and went out for a Korean barbecue and some really dodgy part of town, but it turned out to be a, a tremendous time. But uh, now Frank, uh, Frank and Ken, they're, they're both great. Um, I've been, like I said, a fan of uh, Ken, even predating MMA. I did, it wasn't a thing. There was Pancrase. Uh, I'm sure there was something in Japan that resembled this, but not really. But. Ken Ken's an interesting guy. In fact, at one point in an interview, I said he's Hamlet in tights, yeah. because to be or not to be, which Ken would show up? Ken in UFC three. Uh, walks away from the opportunity to get a $60,000 payday when Hoyce can't uh, compete in the semifinal bout and Ken was there to, you know, to avenge that loss in UFC 1. His father is arguing with him back in the dressing room saying, Ken, Harold Howard, come on, he's karate. It's not a problem. You just go out, you, it's 60000 So I had to put the alternate uh, a, 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 a police officer from Omaha, Nebraska, um, uh, in as a substitute, and Ken didn't come out. He and his father didn't talk for uh, uh, two months after that. Uh, no, Bob, Ken, Bob, Bob Shamrock. Bob Shamrock, yeah. But uh, Ken is a very uh, he's a mercurial guy. Another example of that is the people from Sports Illustrated were interviewing Ken for an um, for a story for the magazine, and he was matched up with Dan Severin. And this was, I believe, uh, the UFC in Detroit and um, Super Fight. And we were under a lot of pressure that week from the judge who was, in effect, saying, you can hold this event in Detroit, but we got to modify some things here. And Bob Myrowitz uh, from Semaphore Entertainment turned to John McCarthy and I and said, uh, we're going to have to probably go along with some stuff. We agreed to the judge's mandate that there be no closed fist punching. John McCarthy and I went around to the dressing room before the, the event, and John in that Marine Corps gunny drill sergeant voice of his said, everybody be quiet, I just got something to tell you. And I stepped up to the microphone and said, hey guys, um, there ain't gonna be no closed fist punching. You guys have heard about it, it's been talked about in the press, we're gonna have to do this. I'm gonna find you $100 for each punch. And oh. I'll collect it. After, if you do it, if you forget and just, you know, do it on, you know, but Ken with the people from uh, Sports Illustrated interviewing him and saying he was a role model for the, for the kids in the, uh, in the, uh, the Shamrock home, um, said, I, I don't think I can punch. Now, Dan Severn had done a radio interview on Wednesday and said, I don't know about that punching thing. I'm going to punch. I'm, when I get in there with Ken, Ken better be prepared. He said, I'm going to close my fist. I'm going to hit him. So Ken, before the event. Two hours before the event, I get a call from his wife, Tina, and she says, you better come up to the hotel room because Ken's threatening. He's not going to fight. I went up there. I talked to him. David Isaacs came up and talked to him. Bob Myrowitz from Semaphore came up and talked to him. So now you got two executives from Semaphore and me begging Ken to do the event. He's emotional. He's on the edge of crying. He's upset. He's not going to fight. So finally, Bob Myrowitz turned to him and said, Ken, I I, I'm done. You know, if you're not going to fight, fine. Just, just tell me now or tell me in five minutes. And he walked out of the room. Ken eventually pulled himself together and fought. And it was one of the dullest fights we ever had. And the pay-per-view numbers dropped in the next show because the the, the match that they had, Severin had a, a game plan where he was going to stay away from Ken. And the two of them did a ballet show and it, it hurt our pay-per-view numbers. So I with Ken Shamrock, you never quite knew which Ken Shamrock was going to show up. When he did show up, the fans were in love. He was exciting. He was also had a tendency, I remember in the Ultimate Ultimate, uh, was it the first one or the second one, 96, with uh, Brian Johnson, he broke his hand um, and couldn't fight, and I didn't get him in the finals. So Ken was, for me, a mixed bag. Um, but I, st I say to this day, he's a legend in the sport. He sold a lot of tickets for us. He deserves a lot of credit for being the pioneer he was and being the great showman. On the other hand, Frank Shamrock is one of my absolute all-time favorites. He was a guy undefeated in the octagon, uh, did everything for me, including beating Olympic gold medalist Kevin Jackson. Hello. Uh, I like Frank Shamrock. He, along with Don Fry and Marco Huis, in a sense, were 
some of the early pioneers across training, oh, yeah. coming in fully prepared, right cardio, uh, the right uh, training that you needed to compete in the emerging sport of mixed martial arts, no longer NHB. Yeah, he he was the guy. He he beat down Tito when Tito was on his upswing. I mean, this is when right before Tito really caught wind and became a huge star. Um, he won the belt yeah. and retired in the ring. Said later. That was a. It was a very. It was like a shocking event. I was like, man, Frank's. He did it. He got the belt, and he he had a back mount, and it was just he had, he made Tito tap to those strikes from the back, and it was just it was a huge. It was a huge night. I, I've, I've been a Frank fan forever, and he's. Uh, I live in San Jose, and he's the guy in San Jose. So we have our um, Avaya Stadium out there now with the new forty. It's next to the new Forty Nine er Stadium, and that's where the San Jose Earthquakes play. It's our MLS team, right? So when when Frank's in town, he lives somewhere Hollywood now because he's uh, his movie. Whole movie his broadcast career has actually taken off. He's 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 transitioned fully into being a you know kind of a broadcasting guy. He did the Strike Force thing. He works with Bellator. I think is a brand ambassador as well. Yes, he, he and Coker and um, yes, all these guys, um, Mauro Vernalo, they all go way back. So. Um, when he's in San Jose, he we were at the the uh, the earthquakes game, the the uh, the MLS team, mm -hmm. and we're you know he has the uh, the BMW club. It's basically right on the field where the, that's this couch thing. It's just reserved for him when he shows up. And uh, they had him kick out the first goal of the game, and he got a bigger damn ovation than half the goals that got kicked in from, <laughs> from, from, from the team. I believe it. And he'd come out there in the HP Pavilion, which has been renamed more times than I can. It's the SAP Center now, the financial mm -hmm. right. software company. They probably do more stuff, whatever. But um, he would come out dressed in his San Jose Sharks. You know, he, he knows how to get over in a local town. And he was right. like the guy. He's not even really from San Jose. <laughs> but he became like the San Jose right. guy, and they loved him there. Um, he's a, he's, a, he's a, a, a good guy in every way. Uh, he'll do what he says he, what he's going to do. You could shake hands with him. You could trust him. Uh, to me, he was a complete martial artist. I once did an article for, I think, Grappling Magazine or uh, Gladiator Magazine, Todd Hester's uh, publication out of the, the L.A. area, in which I came up with a rating system that Nat Fleischer had used to rate boxing champions for Ring Magazine. And using this formula, I concluded that he and... and um, and Randy Couture were the two most complete fighters that I personally had ever had any experience with. They were they had everything that you needed, and they they had charisma, they had showmanship, they had ring generalship, mm -hmm. and they gave you whatever they had. Uh, you could rely on them. They were they were you know, but they also had a complete you know a, 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 a listing of skills. They had a complete reservoir of talents that they could bring. Uh, Couture is interesting because when I booked him into UFC 13. Uh, I put him up against a pro wrestler, uh, Tony Halmey, the Viking, also wrestled under the name of uh, Ludwig Vorga, Count Ludwig oh, Vorga. I think he passed away. He passed he? away. He had become a senator in his uh, native country, I think, of Norway or Iceland. He, I think Is he, it, I want to say Iceland. Iceland. Uh, he was yeah. a big, uh, blonde-headed uh, Ar yes. Aryan fellow, yes. yeah, 270 pounds or 280 some odd pounds, six yep. foot four, and he had made the announcement before that uh, that that uh, heavyweight tournament. It was a two-round tournament that he was going to rip Randy's arm off and beat him to death with it, and Randy <laughs> beat him in 56 seconds with a rear naked choke. So my career with Randy goes back uh, almost 20 years, and he also was a guy who just got better and better. And everything he said he was going to do, whenever he came to a show, he gave you everything he had. Uh, look at his bout with uh, Vitor Belfort. Uh, you know, he, he had some memorable fights. And for me, he was one of the great ones. But I feel the same way about Frank Shamrock. I also have a real soft spot for my good friend, Don Fry. Oh, man. Who has been having some health problems of recent. But uh, uh, he's a guy that I uh, just enjoyed doing business with. And when he was inducted into the uh, UFC Hall of Fame here this last July, I saw that uh, great speech that he gave. And he tells the story afterwards that at the event after the uh, UFC where he had lost to Coleman, and Coleman was in the finals, but there was nobody for him to fight. It's the only UFC that didn't end up with a final two men at, in the octagon. 
Everyone had been injured. Roberto Traven from Brazil had been injured. Scott Ferrozo was injured. Tank Abbott had been beaten. There was nobody for Mark Coleman to fight. And Don tells the story. I came out into this into the arena, and I found Don sitting cage side with the fans, and said, "Don, would you like to fight Coleman?" And he looked at me. He said, "Now?" I said, "Yeah, right now." He said, "Can you make that happen?" I says, "Yes." He said, what about the commission? I said, don't worry about the commission. He said, what about the money? I said, don't worry about the money. I said, it can be happen. Will you do it? And he thought about it and turned me down. And he says, I still am kicking myself in the butt 20 years later because the next two matches that he had with Coleman were in Japan uh, in Pride and uh, it was a different game and so forth and so on. But he felt that night with maybe Coleman having already had um, two matches already and being maybe a little tired out, and him coming in fresh, that it would have been his opportunity to avenge the loss that he had at UFC 10. Yeah, wow, Coleman was just a monster back then. Him and his protege, uh, Mark Kerr. Yes. The, the smashing machine. And and, and Randy... Um, Co- was it Couture? No, I'm talking about, uh, I'm trying to think of the guy from Ohio State who later became heavyweight champion, passed away recently. Randleman? No. Kevin Randleman. Kevin Randleman, okay, there you go. And so that night... With no one to fight, including Don Fry, we staged an exhibition, Bob Marowitz and I, with Kevin Randleman, who had been an Ohio State uh, contemporary and actually been coached at that point by in Ohio State by uh, Mark Kerr. And they did a wrestling exhibition, two buddies doing a wrestling, not a real MMA match. And that's how that fight ended. That event that night ended. Would have been a lot better if I had been able to get Don Fry in there. Yeah, any event where you can get Don Fry out there is a better event. He's he's just, he's a class act. His fights, um, he's had some just absolute wars. But even he had his his show online. He's like the Don Fry yes. show. Where yes. He's sitting there. He had a glass of whiskey and a cigar or something. He's and he's nice. He you know, the big leather chair. Oh, the guy's hilarious. He's, Don's a character. He is. He's he a is. character. He also one of the greatest nights for me. And uh, when people ask me, you know, you look back on the five years that you were with the UFC. In some respects, uh, Ultimate Ultimate 96, um, where he finally got Tank Abbott and choked him out after getting really st- shocked and slugged by Abbott early on. Abbott had gone uh, to, to train with uh, Stanky, and, uh, who'd been training B- Belfort, and could finally learn how to throw a straight left. And he rocked uh, Fry early in that final match uh, there at, U- at U- Ultimate Ultimate 96. And Fry held on. Uh, Abbott ran out of gas. They ended up on the ground, and he finally was able to sink in a choke. And that night, I think, was an incredible high for all of us because the previous year, we'd had another good-looking guy with a mustache, Dan Severn, win the Ultimate Ultimate. And I was uh, that, that second Ultimate Ultimate, Clint, I wanted to get Coleman in. I wanted to get Huas back. Um, we didn't get everything we wanted that night, but we got a great matchup between the man you love to hate, uh, Tank Abbott, <laughs> and you know the, the incredible the predator Don Fry. Tank Abbott, that, that, he was a legitimately scary guy. Even though he, he wasn't like undefeated or anything, you just saw him and you're like, this guy's pissed. He's fresh off a bar stool. He just got off his bike. He might shoot me. I'm not sure. And uh, did did you see he wound up doing a stint in pro wrestling? Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, they killed him. They yeah. had him dancing with a boy band. Like, what yeah. are you doing to this guy? Yeah. He's a monster. They just didn't book him right. But I always liked Tank Abbott. I I, I saw he fought um get the Kimbo Slice, didn't he? Yes, eventually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which yeah. was a mistake. But I tell you something interesting about uh, early on. You know, you, you talk in television about Q scores and about uh, the popularity and how people uh, as a character connect with an audience. Uh, at one point, I brought him cage side in Buffalo, uh, UFC 7. He wasn't fighting that night. And I brought him in through the front door of the arena. Bob Myrowitz was standing by the octagon. So I walked, Tank and I walked the the entranceway all the way down to the octagon. The crowd, which had now been assembled waiting for the first opening match, saw Tank and started to yell, chant, scream. Guys were uh, lifting up their shirt showing that they had painted T-A-N-K on they and their <laughs> buddy's chest. And when we got to the octagon, Bob turned to me and said, damn, he said, he's the male Roseanne. He's huge. And when Bob had an opportunity with the producers of Friends, which at that time was a huge hit comedy show oh, yeah. on network, they wanted to cast a, a, a UFC fighter where um, one of the characters was going thinking about going into the UFC. And uh, 
we brought Vitra Belfort and we brought Tank Abbott to the studio and we're going to let the producers finally decide. They took one look at Tank when he popped his teeth out of his mouth, his false teeth, and he was putting on his show, doing the Tank Act, and they said, forget Belfort, we're putting him in. That That's was it. so funny. Yeah. Com- comparing the two of, like, if you're looking at, you know, 2016 and what a mixed martial arts guy would look like, I mean, like, classic Vitor, not, you know, yeah. retired v- Vitor now after years and years in the mm-hmm. cage. But, I mean, if you to take them both as is right then, the legitimate, like, <laughs> scariest man on earth, the, the, the guy that floored von der Leyen in, in less time than it takes to blink with those speed punches, like they're almost like those cheat kundo punches where he just, just a barrage of them just right to his face. He was the phenom when he first came on board. Oh, he was the phenom. He, he was. He was. Um, I was a scary person. And, um, I remember going down in the rain. I decided not to take a plane from Vegas. I had my house in Boulder City, and I drove down and went to Carlson Gracie School on La Cienega in L.A., and Vito was training with Vali Ishmael, who I also put in the UFC. And uh, uh, he was having some problems with his knee, and we had talked about changing his name. We had talked about billing him as Vito Gracie. They actually, well, he, if you find those old rumble on the rock, those Hawaii MMA, you know, videos way back in the day, not the best production quality, but yeah, he was, um, Victor Gracie. Yes. He wasn't Vitor Belfort, just like you said. Yeah. Bob Marowitz was really the high uh, charger on that. He was the hard charger on that. He really wanted for, to, for, all, for me in particular to convince, cause I was close to Vitor to convince him to go along with that. And Vitor really wasn't happy with that. But I remembered that I came down with an envelope full of cash. That helps. And I opened up that envelope and I handed in that cash and I signed him right that day. And that began the career with him. Uh, and uh, again, Carlson Gracie School, uh, you know, you had some great guys training there. But Val- him and Valige were working out together. And I eventually put Valige in. And, of course, you may remember the story that Valige eventually competed against Hoist Gracie in a jiu-jitsu match at Malacana Stadium years later in Rio de Janeiro and beat Hoist. Oh, how did that go uh, for future relations between the two families? Oh, wow. Well, I remember the funny story was uh, Horian and I had a lot in common in the early UFC in, in, in two areas. We both enjoyed exposing the phonies. The phonies being, you know, guys who were taking some sort of class where if you touch somebody, it was the death touch and you could make them, it was like hypnosis, you could knock them out. And uh, uh, this one did the, uh, the, the, you know, it was been trained by a Shaolin monk. Oh, okay. So I would put guys like that in. Horian and I loved, you know, exposing these, the, what we call the, uh, uh, the magazine champions, you know. Oh, yeah. That, we had that in common. And we shared that. Uh, Horian got a kick out of it, and I felt that my job as Booker matchmaker was I was there for the fans' benefit. I used to say to myself, "What do the fans want to see? Would, would the fans want to see me to bring in a Yokozuna from Japan for real, a, 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 yes. the, the top guy from Sumo? We brought in Koji Katal. Would the fans want to see me bring a guy like Ryan Parker in, who had been a chief exponent of George Dillman's pressure point system? Oh, I saw that guy on National Geographic Channel." Where he uh, he does the no touch knockout, the whammy or whatever right. the it whammy. is. The whammy, yeah. That it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. So we we had that in common. On the other hand, when I would bring up, and you're a black belt in jujitsu, you'll be able to appreciate this, Clint. I would bring up Brazilians, and Ori would say to me, Arturo. You, these are my cattle. I understand these people. Do not worry about him. He's no big deal. I said, what do you? Wait a minute. Uh, you know, uh, Hugo Duarte. I want to bring in Uga Duarte. I saw the one that he did on the beach with Hickson. Hey, no big deal, Arturo, don't worry. I wanted to bring in Marco Huas. I wanted to bring in Murillo Bustamante, Amory Betech, Vali Ishmael. Horny would say, Arturo, these people, they're in Brazil, they're very marginal. He'd say to me, do not worry about that. Now, after we sold the UFC in April of 1995 to Bob Marowitz, Horian and the Gracies were no longer in. In fact, I was pressuring Horian to let me know who was going to be the representative. Was it going to be Hoist again for UFC 6? And I couldn't get an answer from him. So I knew that I would see. You have to remember, Clint, starting in UFC 2, we added the referee could stop the fight. 
We added rounds. We added judging. We added time limits. We added gloves later on. We added a lightweight class and a heavyweight class. Things were changing. And quite frankly, Horion and the Gracies really wanted it to remain valetudo. Yes. And I understood that and I respected that. But I kept saying to them, this thing has to evolve. Horion used to jokingly say to me, Arturo, are you going to end up like Art McMahon? Are you going to be the <laughs> Art Davy of wrestling? I said, no, my friend, but look, this has to evolve. So after UFC 5, if you look at the history of the UFC, you'll see that Art Davy started to bring in the Marco Huases, the Amory Bateches, the Marilla Bustamantes, the Fabio Gugels, because I wanted, I had done my homework. I knew there was this whole other universe down in, in Rio where people were not only doing jujitsu, but were doing, adding Muay Thai to the mix. And we're looking at Sambo techniques and so forth. By the way, the great exponent in the Gracie family who died in a hang gliding accident, Holes Gracie. Oh, yeah. He, as you know, with yep. your background in, as a black belt clan, you know that he was the, the real innovator in the family. He was older even than Hickson and so forth. Hickson looked up to him. And I always felt like a lot of the willingness that Hickson had to incorporate yoga or to look at Sambo techniques was due to the influence of Holes as his brother. He was the inspirational brother. Blonde Laura, they used to call him. He was blonde, blue-eyed. Beautiful good young man who died tragically in a hang gliding accident. So I was knew that there was this whole other universe in Brazil. And when the Gracies were no longer there, then in a sense I was free now to book anyone from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Remember, as long as Hoist was there and winning, you know, there was no reason for me to bring in someone else. But I will tell you an interesting story that I've only told once or twice before. And that is, after UFC 3, Hoist had been pressured by Horian to step down and out. And we were asking Hickson to come in. Wow. I said, Horian, how do we do this? He said, the old man's coming to town, Elio. Oh. He said, when the old man comes to town, we set it up. He said, we'll do it over at the WOW office. I had a big, gigantic, inexpensive blue conference table <laughs> that was my desk. And I remember it was a Saturday morning, and it was Elio Gracie, Horion, Hoyce, and Hickson. And I remember that Elio and Hoyce were sitting on the couch to my right. Hoyce was sitting next to the fish tank that he had given me. He had a fish tank, Clint, filled with two piranha that he used to keep in that little room that he lived at uh, above the Gracie, uh, the garage. When I first met him, he lived in a garage at the Gracie house above the garage. And he had this hexagonal fish tank. He and Horia went on a seminar. They stayed too long, maybe an extra day. When he came home, there was only one piranha. So I actually inherited that piranha and the fish tank. So I remember that it was Elio Gracie sitting on the couch next to Hoyce, and Hoyce had his head down, looking very subdued. Horian had already talked to him about Art starting to bring these big wrestlers in. And after the situation with, um, with uh, Kimo in UFC 3, I think Horian was now willing to say, maybe I'll patch up if there's any rough spots between me and my brother Hickson, and we'll ask him to come in. Now, I had had dinner a week or two before with Hickson over at the Brazilian restaurant by Brazil on Cabrillo Avenue. Nice. And I found out that he followed the Gracie diet, but he was a big meat eater. He would eat meat quite a bit. And uh, he was very guarded, though, in dealing with me because I was Horian's partner. And I could tell that it was very hard for me to get close to Hickson. I never got close to Hickson. So that day, Hickson is sitting off to my left. Horian is sitting right in front of me. I'm on the other side of the blue table, and Elio and Hoyce are to my right. And Horian's going to conduct part of the meeting in, Brazil, in Portuguese, and I'll conduct some of it in English. And basically, we're offering Hickson to come in. And Hoyce is already sitting there with his hands down and his head down. He's sitting with his hands in his lap, very quiet. And Hickson then finally says, well, I want a million dollars. And Horian says, Hickson, nobody's getting a million dollars right now. Well, I hear Mike Tyson gets $10 million. I want a million. And he went on and on about this. And he finally turned to me and he said, you and Horian are making a million dollars. Horian said, we're not making a million dollars yet. The old man finally raised his hand and the room got quiet. And he looked at Hickson and he spoke to him in Portuguese. Afterwards, Horian translated for me. What he said to Hickson was, in my day, we fought for honor. We fought to defend the family's name. I used to put an ad in the newspaper, if you want a broken arm, call me. Hmm. He said, that's what we did. He said, you've been in North America too long. You're now thinking only of money. 
Hickson stood up, bowed to his father, shook my hand, did not look at Horian and left the room, and we never got Hickson Gracie in the UFC, ever. But Hoist was willing to step down after three and let Hickson come in if we could have made a deal. True story. It, it would have been awesome to have the fights with Hickson. We eventually got him in Pride briefly. As part of it was the Japan versus Gracie card, a Pride. It was an early Pride. It was like Pride Six or something, one of the Bushido events, and uh, that was kind of Gracie. Half was on the card as well, um, and it, but having him in the UFC and uh, being able to go out and sort of really, Clint, as a as a as a as a jujitsu black belt, Brazilian jujitsu black belt. Um, what what is your opinion of uh, Hickson's career in Pride? Hickson's career in pro combat sports, as you look back on it, do you have any thoughts about that as to what it was, what it what it might have been, what it wasn't, et cetera? Wow, uh, Hickson Gracie, uh, his contribution on the mat in jujitsu and uh, his Valley Tudo background before is legendary, right? But what we got from him in pro MMA in the larger promotions, I wish we would have got more. I, I, I feel like the legend didn't always necessarily work out to the best matchups. I think there were a lot of real legendary matchups. A lot of people wish we would have seen. And for whatever reason, they just, it didn't happen. Um, like a Mark Coleman versus uh, yeah, of course, of course, any Nixon of these at, at the time, um, Mark Coleman was, um, was a, was a, was just a smasher, right? And seeing someone, you know, like a Hickson go against him just to see how the styles work out. Um, Hickson had all the potential to be the biggest star. Uh, Hoist was the guy, though, right? That's who everyone knows. But the real jujitsu fans and like the the hardcore MMA fans, they know Hickson's name is like the legend, right? But I don't know that we saw his full potential in pro MMA. And I don't think he made the money he could have, uh, you know, just by the, the, the limited fights we did see that he was on these large promotions as he had a million and one fights and other promotions. And sure. Uh, Jiu-jitsu matchups, Valley Tudo, uh, no holds barred, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, of course. Is he a legend? Yes. Is he, you know, one of the, the greatest instructors and jujitsu practitioners ever. Yeah. Is his son an absolute monster now in, uh, and you know, he's going in jujitsu and he's a multi-time world champion with very like fundamental, not flashy jujitsu at all. He's very much like Hickson. Um, so yeah, he's, he's contributed so much, but in terms of seeing the big fights, the dream matches, we didn't get that. And I, I don't think anyone's debating that or disputing that. So, yeah, I think that was uh, a disappointment for the fans. I remember I did an article once for a magazine in which I compared Hickson to Sergio Oliva in bodybuilding and that Oliva, once Schwarzenegger came along, retired from competing and uh, made sure that he never faced Schwarzenegger, who became the most dominant Mr. Olympia and kind of eclipsed the great Sergio Oliva from Cuba. And I felt that that's kind of what happened to Hickson. I'll give an example of that. After, uh, after one of the UFCs, uh, the Japanese uh, press was there. Remember the uh, baseball magazine Shah from Tokyo? And they were ex asking Hoist, you know, about jujitsu and what did he think? And Hoist at one point said, well, if you think I'm pretty good at jiu-jitsu, you ought to see Hickson. And then the press in Japan discovered Hickson at that point, and they began to figure if Hoist is saying that he's 10 times better than I am, that was the statement Hoist made. I, I talk about in the book that the night after the first UFC, we had established a tradition of a post-fight party, and that first one was the Monster's Bowl because we asked everybody to show up in formal clothes, uh, you know, tuxedos and evening gowns, and, <laughs> and it was fun. And, uh, but I said there were three unhappy people in that room that night. Number one was Pat Smith. He had expected, based upon the fact that he was a Denver star, you know, uh, had won the Sabaki Challenge. Everybody in town knew Pat Smith. Um, uh, Ken Shamrock was, uh, was an unhappy camper that night because he thought that the kid in the karate pajamas was going to be easy to beat. And he got his, you know, parade got rained on and the other unhappy guy that night sitting right behind me on a table in the ballroom was Hicks and Gracie. His wife, Kim was berating him and saying, I heard it. And I was sitting with Frederico Lapenda, who later became a friend, spoke uh, Portuguese, was from Recife in Brazil. And uh, later in partnership with Bas Boone of, of glory kickboxing. And he told me, he said, 
Kim was was saying, you let your brother rodeo you. You let Hickson, you let Horian rodeo you so that, you know, that Hoist is now the family champion and we, everyone knows that Hoist isn't the family champion. You're the family champion. You should have won tonight. That should be your check. You should be getting that medal. So the three unhappy guys were Pat Smith, Ken Shamrock, and Hickson Gracie. Um, I feel that I tried on two separate occasions to get Hickson into the UFC. It just wasn't meant to be. But uh, if you look at his record on Sure Dog and you look at the opponents that he, that he competed against in, quote, MMA, you have to be underwhelmed. Yeah, the, uh, the, the overall, I mean, the overall record, it, they aren't the biggest stars. He did, you know, make a name in Japan. The Gracies carried it over from, obviously, their, their legendary status in jiu-jitsu and Valetudo. Um, and this, his contribution is obviously not accurately represented by that win loss record right for sure yeah but it's what we got and um he's healthy he has all his faculties yes um i don't think he's hurting uh he's uh he actually still teaches at uh crone school so crone has a small yes. academy uh, wherever in la i know the torrance academy is the gracie academy so that's the the henner and heron right who's so they must have been small children when you first met these guys. They're in the first UFC, wiping the blood up from the octagon. Uh, the people from uh, Viewer's Choice and the investor from BMG, Bertelsmann's Music Group in Frankfurt, Germany, had sent a wire to Bob Marowitz and saying, you can't have kids wiping up blood in the octagon. So so we, we made sure for UFC 2 that that wasn't happening. But they were like, when I first met uh, Halleck, he was in... Um, Soccer. I remember seeing him at a soccer match. He was like seven, six or seven or seven maybe. And I remember him running over the other kids. He was like a tank. And I said to Horian, does he understand that, that soccer is not a contact sport? And Horian shook his head. And he says, you can only tell Halleck that, but he may not listen. <laughs> so Halleck was this little monster even as a kid. But yeah, uh, I, I remember that Henner would come over to the WOW office and he was such a bright kid. He would like pick my brains. And I understand today that the marketing genius over at the Gracie Academy is Henner. Oh, yeah. uh, but I remember him asking me questions when he was like 12. When, when you spend any time with Henner Gracie, you immediately see the enthusiasm. And uh, <clears throat> so whatever he's talking about, he's, he's on, right? And he's even on when there's no cameras. But, you know, he's he's really excited about whatever is whatever he's trying to put over, and he's trying to put something over at all times. Like he's working. <laughs> right. That guy works. That yeah. guy hustles. Um, and he's got Eve doing it too. Yeah. She's also you know very much in a right. part. She's the head of the women's empowered program. They had um, I guess there was something with an Uber driver that uh, mm. it it was not the the real Uber driver picked up a girl and tried to attack her and she got away thankfully, and they took that incident and spun it into a video of how what you could do if you're in a car and how you could use Gracie Jiu Jitsu to ah. use a choke, a guillotine, a, a you know, t shirt as a lapel choke or a triangle choke nice. as a as a woman being attacked, you know, in a in a, in a car in, in the back in an of an enclosed the, environment. Right? Yeah. And this thing got like fifty million views on YouTube and blew up and they started doing a, a wave of these Gracie women empowered course tapes and uh, classes and online and in person and free seminars. They did one in East LA at uh, the community center. So there, there's uh, you can, there's this thing called self help art and graphics in East LA, um, and they did a big free women's mm. uh, self defense mm -hmm. seminar and it was Gracie Jiu Jitsu and the punchline was come to a Gracie certified academy. Don't just look up BJJ, <laughs> and they have this whole way now of getting women into Jiu Jitsu and uh, they start you online. And they, you know, get you working with a friend to where, you know, right. you break that sort of, uh, you know, the, the barrier of being in close quarters because most women, they're like, jujitsu, I ain't doing that. That's, right. you know, we might as well be making out. Yeah. And they break the, they, they break the ice through the online thing and they get them in. They say, well, now that you've done the tapes, don't just go to a BJJ school because you'll be, it'll be just as bad. You want to go to a certified Gracie Academy training center and here's the list of them and here's headquarters and they're all over the darn place. And so you spend any time with those guys and. Henner became a, a real marketing oh, uh, whiz and, uh, uh, it's interesting that really none of the boys really got into MMA to any great extent. Halleck, uh, in fact, I'm still hearing that uh, 
is he might be signed by Bellator? Is he signed by Bellator? I'm not sure. He, I think he is. He has, I think he is. I think he's got a fight coming up. I know Crone, Crone's doing it. Yeah. But I think he's part of a different. He's part of a different promotion. I thought he was part of a One FC or something. Yeah, in uh, in, in Asia. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, I, I remember all of the Gracie kids. Uh, I remember Sajina, who's now a beautiful five foot eight inch girl, young woman. Uh, but I remember all the kids. Uh, you know, back in the day. Um, it, it was a great time when we did the early UFC. Uh, there was a great uh, camaraderie. Uh, some of our investors, when we first uh, incorporated WOW, we had 28 investors. About 20 or 21 of them were Gracie students. Uh, one of them was Richard Bressler, and his parents came in. Um, uh, John Milius came in as our creative consultant and our creative director. Uh, Ethan Milius uh, who uh, has a great relationship, has had a great relationship with the Gracie family, and is now a, a public prosecutor in the uh, the district attorney's office in L.A., was part of the uh, scene. Um, he was taking uh, jujitsu lessons early. Again, my fellow student uh, that I would see every week was John Milius, and uh, John uh, became a, a, a friend and was a great consultant for us. Really believed early on that what we were doing was creating the new Excalibur, this was the opportunity that uh, eventually 50 million people at some point would be watching this in the future on some version of maybe the internet or something. And John was right. Um, it, it happened. It's here. It, it, it did happen. But I was, I, I've done, and I've said in interviews, and when I accepted the a Hall of Fame ring, with the, and I gave a speech about this, that my original inspiration was pancreation. I knew that 648 BC, within a couple of Olympic Games, no holes barred fighting, became the number one sport. The only rival apparently it had, if you go back to the history books on this, is horse racing in the Olympics, of all things. Uh, it, it was bigger than the decathlon. It was bigger than the marathon. Uh, there was a great statue erected in the Altus uh, to Poly uh, uh, Polydamus, which was the great uh, champion of Pancration, Polydamus. Supposedly, he was the largest man in ancient Greece. He was The statue of him, Clint, would have indicated... And again, that people must have been smaller then. He was six foot eight and weighed 300 pounds. Oh my God. And he was the champion of pancreation. So I knew by bringing pancreation back that we were bringing back something which had already proven itself in the ancient world. Well, the way I always viewed it was it was a reboot of pro wrestling. You basically went back to the days when it was real. And before you had to say, well, we want to do this thing once a week. How the hell are we going to do that if it's real? Because we can't protect our champions. We can't protect the draws. We're just going to put random people out there. No one's going to come. But with the UFC, you space them out. You get more fighters. And then eventually you build them up. You hope you get guys with personality. And hopefully you coach them and let them know, yeah, you're fighting. Yeah, it's real. But it's show business. And here's how I can tell you it's show business. They don't do it out back for 10 bucks an hour for you know, no one watching. I always felt like uh, one of the strengths that I had as a booker and a matchmaker was that I had an eye for talent. Uh, I think that seven of the people that are in the UFC Hall of Fame are people that I booked. Uh, Severin, Shamrock, Gracie, Fry. Couture. Uh, Couture, um, Coleman. Um, but the list goes on and on. Uh, uh, Kerr, uh, Maurice Smith. Uh, you know, I, there, there was some great fighters back in the day. And even guys like Abbott, I, I knew I had a feeling for what would sell and what the public would respond to. And uh, we, we did a pretty good job of creating, uh, you know, some, some legendary characters. Well, it, it, it comes down to, and it, it's funny because when I say it's the reboot of pro wrestling, you know, you look at what Vince McMahon does, right? Yeah, it's predetermined. <clears throat> and the UFC, yeah, it's real. But when you, that is down to talent relations, that's down to booking. What we're really talking about is two things, two questions with every single thing you do in either an octagon or a ring. Why are they fighting and why should I pay to see it? And that was your gig and you clearly did a good job because we're, we're looking at UFC yeah. 206 coming up. Right. You got guys like Conor McGregor that finally figured out, oh, it's show business. Oh, if I figured out how to use one of these gimmicks, one of these microphones, I can put myself over. Absolutely. And I can make a tell a compelling story, even if the guy over there is you know, more boring than, you know, watching paint dry, we'll figure out a way to sell this damn thing. They were starting to to pick up on this early. Uh Chemo and Joe San showed up with a cross. 
uh, which was looked like it had been taken as a as something from pro wrestling. I remember Scott Ferrozo in doing interviews would wear sunglasses. Yep. And would cultivate a wrestling style interview. So early on, some of the guys were picking up the cue that we're in the sports entertainment business, folks. Um, that's what we're really doing. Abbott was a big plus in this direction. Yep. I was also, you know, we had we had uh, a plus with Abbott because he could he liked to fight. Had nothing to do with the octagon. I remember when we were in Puerto Rico, we walked into a bar and he announced that he would beat any mighty cone in the house. <laughs> and uh, I said, said, Dave, I said, we were, you know, l- let me get out of here before you finish th- making this speech. So, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, and by, of course, he was the guy that uh, mugged uh, Pat Smith in an elevator in Casper, Wyoming. Oh, that that's a great story. <laughs> I'm having breakfast. You're going to laugh, Clint. I'm having breakfast the morning after the event in Casper. And I'm having breakfast with two guys. One of them is Big John McCarthy who I always like to sit down and have a plate of eggs and a cup of coffee with. The other is John Wayne Bobbitt, who's, okay. yes, his wife had amputated his, his, his male yeah. organ. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. He, he had a black belt in Taekwondo, and he had come to Casper to meet me and to see if he could persuade me to put him into the UFC. So we're all having breakfast, and we hear this commotion down the hallway. There's the elevators. And now I hear yelling. McCarthy and I got up and started to run toward the elevators. Who passes us doing 80 miles an hour is Maurice Smith. He gets to the elevator first. Inside the elevator is uh, several of Tank's posse, and they've got Pat Smith on the floor of the elevator, and they're kicking him. Abbott had already left, and I see Abbott going down the hallway. He looks at me over his shoulder, and he waves, gives me one kind of a a little (laughs) Miss America hand wave, and he boogied. He's gone. But they had all jumped Pat Smith in the elevator. I stayed with Pat until Monday afternoon over at the hospital. They did 16 stitches inside of his mouth. I forget how many outside. He was all battered and cut, and I stayed there with the company credit card paying the hospital bill. So he he and I were the last people to leave Casper from the UFC (laughs) But so Abbott was, you know, was the real deal in terms of his willingness to fight in the parking lot if, if, if that came, if it came to it, you know, and he was always willing to challenge Ken Shamrock, who used to say to me, Art, Shamrock's the world's biggest 170 pound man. Oh my. Without vitamin S, he only weigh 170 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, we, early on, th- we had guys understanding what McGregor now understands completely, and that is it's sports entertainment, folks. So I, we, did, we did look to the wrestling world. In fact, I, I was a big boxing fan, but I was also a guy who under, understood and appreciated the tremendous show that wrestling is. They, they understand how to tell a story. It's all it is. They understand how to tell a story. Is it the best story? Is, is most of it geared towards children, yeah, but they're selling to adults. There's a huge fan base globally for it, and so if if you look at uh, a lot of the fighters that have like the Anderson Silvas, they they go back to Muhammad Ali, but Muhammad Ali went back to Gorgeous George and Little Richard. He said that in a bio at one point that he looked to Gorgeous George. That Eileen Eaton and introduced them to, and right there in Los Angeles, yep. and so yeah, so wrestling understands that as well as anyone. And I think that you know fans who say, "Gee, I just want the fighting." The truth of the matter is, is that you get involved with a star on the basis of his personality, his charisma, his persona, and there are guys you like, there are guys you don't like. And I think if you're in the business of booking talent, what you got to look for are people who push buttons, good, good or bad buttons. Uh, Ronda Rousey pushes a lot of interesting buttons. She's a track. She looks like she could be on a surfboard. She's a pretty girl. She's got great credentials in judo. Um, you know, you look at the numbers, and apparently in a document that I saw recently on MMA Junkie, sixty uh, percent of the UFC's pay per view revenue for the last two years is due to two athletes, Conor, Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor. So you know, if you understand show business, you understand you're in the business of entertaining people. A lot of other sports understand that very well. Does football understand it? You betcha they do. Baseball, absolutely. I grew up with Mickey Mantle and Hank Aaron and Duke Snyder and and Willie Mays. So, you know, a lot of sports understood that. The martial arts tried to do something with it. In a sense, when I came along, there was really nothing that had done well. Kickboxing, it had a brief fling, and now the numbers were down. I tell the story, Clint, in the book, Is This Legal?, 
that I knocked on the doors for HBO, Lou DiBella, big boxing guy over at HBO, right? Still is involved in boxing in many ways. And Lou said to me, what else you got? I said, this is it. He said, Art, the martial arts doesn't work on, 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 in, in, you know, on TV. And he said, it's in the movies. He said, you ever hear about the Karate Kid, the best of the best, blood sport, kickboxer? I said, yeah, I've heard of all those. He said, you're not casting a movie. I said, no, I, this is a fight. He said, it'll never work. I went to, I went to uh, Showtime, Jock McLean, uh, Lou, and uh, 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 Jay Larkin, another great boxing guy. And they said the same thing to me. What else you got? So early on, everyone felt that the martial arts wasn't going to be successful. It belonged in the video games, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat. It belonged in the movies, Karate Kid. But it didn't belong on pay-per-view. Everybody said to me, this will fail. Now, the truth of the matter is, when I found Semaphore, I'd been turned down by you know HBO, Showtime, paper, um, uh, ESPN turned me down, Michael Oresco turned me down over there. But when I get to, to the Semaphore, they were doing concerts and comedy. They didn't have a franchise. And I met Campbell McLaren, who was their vice president of acquisitions. And he said, well, we're looking for a franchise. I said, I got it. And when I explained it to him, he went, whoa. He said, a karate guy could fight like a sumo guy? I said, yes. He said, well, what? I explained, there are no rules. And I explained, it's a tournament, and there'll be three fights in one night. Eight men enter, only one man emerges as the champ at the end of the evening. He went, oh, my God, this is great. So we, we were able to put together a deal by May of 93. By uh, August, September 93, I had signed up all the fighters. And I dedicated the book, Is This Legal?, to those 10 guys, the eight fighters and the two alternates, because a lot of guys turned me down. Dennis Alexio, the kickboxer, yep. great kickboxer, was in the movie Kick Fighter with, uh, uh, with Jean-Claude Van Damme. He turned me down. So, Amin Bostepi, the great Turkish martial artist who had great series of ads and instructional videos in the magazines, he turned me down. Bart Vale, shoot fighter, turned me down. The list went on and on, Clint. More people. I went to the Kronk gym and talked to the late Emmanuel Stewart. He said, boy, he says, you're you looking for a heavyweight boxer to get into this? He said, ain't no smart boxer going to get into there with those karate boys. Did anyone approach um, any of the guys from the Foxcatcher uh, besides Schultz, like Kurt Angle, for example? Ah, you're going to love this. In the book, I talk about the fact that I called Dan Gable in the University of Iowa. Nice. He don't take my call. I kept calling. I finally, got, I finally found out that his assistant was a guy named Tom Brand. All right. So I call him. He don't return my call. At one point, when I would call somebody, they would say to me, is this a movie? Are you casting for a movie? I said, no, this is a, this is a real shoot. This is a, this is a fight. Well, you sure it's not a movie? I said, no, it's not a movie. We're doing the real thing. So yeah, I, I went to Dan Gable. I was looking to get maybe a top guy out of the university. You know, very famous wrestling program, as you know. Um, everybody turned me down. Everybody told me I was crazy. Until Dan Severin. And I met him in a Chinese restaurant in Los Angeles where he was doing a work for Chinese businessman up in a room above the restaurant in a meeting room with Al Snow, another working wrestler from the <laughs> WWE. And I talked him into doing it. And he said, don't worry about me. He said, let me tell you about a wrestling match that I had in Turkey with a Russian. He said he broke every rule in the book. He fish hooked my nose. He stuck his finger in my eye. He gave me a knee in the balls. I said, you can do this then. You're going to be fine. So until I was able to get Dan Severin in, and that opened the door, because then uh, Richard Hamilton in Arizona turned me on to Dan, Don Fry, Mark Coleman, uh, so many of the guys at that point, uh, and uh, before you know it, Mark Kerr, and later Mark Schultz. Yep. I love telling, can I tell you the Schultz story, Clint? I'd like to hear it, yeah. We're, 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 in, uh, we're in Detroit, and we're getting ready to do... Uh, this incredible event, and uh, you know, the, the, we had a judge now giving us a hard time about whether or not we could do this event, whether it was legal. They were looking at publicity from previous cities and saying, we don't want this type of thing in our town in Motor City. So the, the day of the press conference, uh, this, on, uh, this is on Thursday, and Dave Benito, who had fought for us already, comes up and says, all right, I broke my hand in the gym this morning. I said, what? You do to fight Gary Goodrich. I got you all set to fight Gary Goodrich from Canada. Um, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I broke my hand. Turns out he had actually broken it two or three days before. He just doesn't tell me. He was trying to see if he could work it, tape it, something. So 
well, I'm standing there in the press conference, and now I got this really word look on my face. Now you got to book a matchmaker who's one fighter down. I, maybe I got to move the, the alternate up. It doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Who walks over to me is Mark Schultz. He's there visiting. He's wearing a Pedro Sauer jiu-jitsu t-shirt because he comes from Salt Lake. He's a wrestling coach over at Brigham Young. And he comes up and he says, Mr. Davey. He calls me Mr. Davey. He said, I've always wanted to meet you. I said, you wanted to meet me. I want to meet you. You're an Olympic gold medalist. So we shook hands and we're standing there talking. And, I, and he said, he says, you look like you're upset about something. I just tell him the Beneteau story. Dave can't fight. So he said, who's going to fight? I said, big Gary Goodrich right over here, former world arm wrestling champ, six foot three, 260 pounds. Mark says to me, I could kick his ass. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, I got a great idea. Now, he, now you got to remember that, that Mark weighs maybe 182 pounds, maybe 5'10". He says, yeah. He said, uh, I got no place. I kick his ass. I said, I'll tell you what. If I can lay some heavy bread on the table, would you be willing to fight tomorrow night? He said, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. So I go over to Bob Myers. I said, look, Mark Schultz says he, he'll fight. And Bob's eyes were already big thinking about it. We got in the press conference. We already had planned to introduce him. Mark Schultz is visiting us, Olympic gold medalist. The guy is the golden boy. He's great. Hero. And, right? 88 Olympics, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So we're talking about the fact now that we might be able to put him in the UFC on short notice. So I went over and got Bob to agree on 50,000, up to 50,000. So I go over and I said to Mark, Mark, look, what it'll take. We started off, I think, at 20, and Mark, you know, was hemming and hawing. He said, look, Art, I didn't, he said, I just had the T-shirt, a pair of shorts, and a pair of flip-flops. I came with a toothbrush and a bag. He said, I'm just here with these guys. I'm just visiting. I said, Mark, what is it going to take to make this happen? Bottom line, Clint, I had to go to 50,000. And I got to sell some people. He puts me on the phone with his wife who <laughs> says, my husband's going to do what? I said, yeah, tomorrow night. And I spent 25 minutes on the phone with her selling on the idea. This was a down payment for a new house in Jordan or in, in Provo. So she says, well, this is pretty interesting, Mr. Davey. I finally got her to agree. Now it ain't over. Now I got to talk to the president of Brigham Young University because there's this issue about the, how, what is this going to look like for the university the, for him? The conduct of a, of a you know, a faculty member. You know? Exactly. A faculty member on, fighting in this banded barbaric event. I spent 35 minutes on the phone with the president of Brigham Young University. And I got to tell you how I did it. All I kept talking about was the glories of ancient Greece and Pancration. And that a guy, um, an athlete like Mark Schultz is the modern incarnation of that. And you know, an athlete always wants to try himself on whatever challenge is there that allow him to test his medal. I said, this is really what it's all about for Mark. And on the basis of Mark testing his medal and that this had been something great in the ancient Greek Olympics, the, the president of Brigham Young finally said, okay. So I got Mark to, <laughs> I got Mark to do it. I stayed up with him till bedtime. Woke him up the next morning at six o'clock, took him to breakfast, took him over for an HIV test and hepatitis B and got and stayed with him right up until noon and let him take a nap. And we got him into the octagon and he was there at the fighters meeting when big John McCarthy said, Art's going to let you know that you can't be fighting with no closed fist punches. So who does he get into the ring with? Of course, the big daddy Goodrich. That's the match. Yep. And he beats Goodrich 260 pounds and he beats him with 41 punches. So I theoretically, Clint, I should have found him $5,100, right? $4,100. He beats him with 41 punches, and I never find anybody. I never collected those fines. Monday morning, there was an article in the Detroit paper that the judge was looking for me. There might be a warrant out for my arrest as a promoter. <laughs> but that's the whole story of Mark Schultz. He only came in for the one event and never competed again. We paid him $50,000 for that one bout. It was really something. Now I was again on short notice. I was willing to to stretch and make it happen. <laughs> oh man, I I just I remember watching the Foxcatcher movie and they show you know the the UFC event and the time skewed. Have you seen the movie? And they kind of they time warp it around a little bit and they make it a little bit more dramatic for right. effect. And back when he's training for the Olympics or whatever, they're showing the UFC and we're like, wait a minute, it's it's ninety six all of a sudden, but we're in eighty eight again and it was. Right. 
But um, yeah, I, re I remember that. That's that's a hell of a story. <laughs> so fifty grand technically is in the hole to you five grand or four <laughs> right. thousand, right? Yeah. But, and then uh, you're not. Uh, you shouldn't probably go back to Wyoming, right? Or, well, oh, we should never go back to Detroit. This is Detroit. Yeah, this and, is Detroit. and you know, Clint, if you look up the record online today, you'll see that the UFC never went back to Detroit, even in the modern era under Zufa. Uh, when when Lorenzo and Frank bought it in 2001, they never went back to Detroit. So I don't know whether there's still some bad blood or still some issues floating around, but we only did that one show in Detroit. So not sure about Detroit. I know all of a sudden that uh, the Zufa doesn't have a piece of it anymore or right. or at least a majority stake in it. Um, no, they sold all of it. All of it, all of it? Yeah. Um, did you wind up keeping a piece of the uh, after so? Oh, no. No, in fact, uh, the true story is is that uh, – uh, after UFC 5, uh, Steve Jenham, our alternate fighting champion, that, uh, that policeman from Omaha, came up to me at UFC 5 and he said, Art, the cops are here are telling me that they could bust me for battery if I fight tomorrow night. He said, I could lose my badge. So we had hired in, um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, the New South, we had hired civil and criminal attorneys to get that show on the air. And the cops were going around telling our fighters including Steve Jenner, who was this warrant officer, that they could be arrested. So looking at that, looking at my ongoing battle with Semaphore Entertainment over what are, what, are we, what are we spending money on, and the fact that after UFC 5, the Gracies weren't coming back, I decided we should sell. And it's in the book, in the epilogue, that Horian really didn't want to sell. But I did. And I was running WOW, and he was running the Gracie Academy. So we sold. And we sold out for, people have asked me why I sold. And I said, well, I had a million reasons. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of the, the wow promotions in the UFC. And we sold cleanly to our TV partner, Semaphore Entertainment Group in New York. Now, Bob calls me up, Bob Myrowitz, the president of Semaphore, a couple of weeks later. And he says, I, I, how do I get fighters? I said, well, I guess I was waiting for you. I knew you'd had to call me at some point. And Horian was very upset because now I had an ongoing role for the next two and a half years. I was the commissioner of Ultimate Fighting, the Ultimate Fighting Alliance, and I was the booker matchmaker until January of 1998. But to answer your question, Clint, uh, Horian and I sold out in April of 95. We retained no ownership. And when Bob sold to the Fertitas in 2001, he sold for $2 million. And then they proceeded to pump probably near $50 million into it oh, yeah. over the next five years. And interestingly enough, I was at Mandalay Entertainment, Mandalay Sports Entertainment, in the early part of the millennium, pitching a show to cable, including Spike, called um, Fight Quest. It was about the ordinary Joes fighting, being coached by the pros. And it was a reality show based on MMA. And Lorenzo was in there pitching to... Um, uh, in fact, he later hired one of the guys from Spike, uh, became an employee, Craig, uh, Craig Bussari, uh from Fox, actually, not from Spike. So I was in there pitching to, uh, to the people in, uh, at uh, Spike TV, a reality show, and the UFC got it. And I knew, and you're a wrestling enthusiast, and in a way so am I, the formula to really take the UFC to the big time was to have a weekly cable show creating your heroes and your villains. That's it. Your baby faces and your heels, and then selling them on pay per view. It's again, why are they fighting, and why should I pay to watch it? Because without that, you do it out back for ten bucks an hour, and, and nobody no will one, care. No one will care. That's why it's show business. What I wanted to do early on, starting after UFC three, and we were still, while well, I was still owned half the show with Semaphore Entertainment, I wanted to put the camera backstage. And Bob Myrowitz fought me on it. He said, I don't want to do that. He said, that'll make the stars out of some of those managers like Charlie Anzalone. I said, who cares? Don't you watch the wrestling with Bobby the Brain Heenan, you know, Mr. Fuji? That's part of the show. Oh, Bobby the Brain Heenan was the most interesting part of the show. That guy could have done anything. Exactly. He could have, you know, he said, and I think Bob was afraid it would have made a star out of me. So quite frankly, we never did. I had seen a, a, a broadcast of the European version of the of the MTV Awards, 
and they put a camera back in the green room, it was better than the award show in front of the camera. It is because you let loose, you relax, you're yourself, and this is how you develop talent. It's by getting to know you. There's going to be someone out there that's going to be endearing to a certain group of the audience. Exactly. The world's a big place. Not everybody, you know, is eating the same damn thing, watching the same damn thing on TV. And the world got a lot smaller with the internet. The world got a lot smaller with the, you know, the widespread distribution of content, whether it's cable TV or the other thing. It's the world's smaller now. Yep. And by being able to, you know, introduce these different personalities, like now the the coaches are now getting kind of famous. Yes. Uh, Dave Camarillo, yes. um, Bob Bob Cook, the the AK, the Gorilla Jiu Jitsu guys. Right. Um, then you look at um, the, the the Hackleman, the Chuck Liddell's coach. You look at um, the guys down in uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, right? So th- these coaches, these all they all have personalities, they have fan bases. It's what happened. Well. Are they not under contract to the UFC or whatever organization? Well, yeah. Well, wait. Where would you see those coaches? Well, UFC. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you had talent contracts with them too, to where your revenue would be directly impact? So if you're you're backstage, you're okay. Look, you want to be on camera. The, these are the areas that are filmed. If you want to be in them, just when the cameras are on, you got to sign a talent contract. You get this much for this. You get this much for this. Be yourself. You know, but, you know, if you draw ratings and you're making money for it's, right. it's a partnership yeah. that you can't just sort of isolate things. If, if there's a demand, you yeah, sell it. Bob Marowitz, I don't think, saw that. And I think he was not prepared for that. But early on, uh, Michael Pilot, the TV producer from Semaphore, and I felt as strongly about it. And uh, I felt that uh, when I was at Mandalay Sports Entertainment, that uh, that uh, you know that there were stars out there, and you, you know you needed to go out and find them. I personally think that anybody who wants to make a, a put a an MMA star on TV would be wise to get Eddie Bravo. Eddie would yeah. be on Eddie on TV would be magic because he's like watching a car accident. You do, you couldn't take your eyes off it when once he got going. He's fascinating. If if you take so his jujitsu classes are the, in the evening. I, I went to one. It ran from like eight o'clock until damn near ten thirty, eleven p.m. And it was he was it wasn't just like do the move and he left. A lot of them were like this. No, first off, they don't publish the address to his headquarters. Right. You got to <laughs> kind of get in through an affiliate or know somebody else. Right. Like so, I, I train with Jean Jacques Machado when uh, I'm down there. So he's he hooked, very close to the Machados. Oh yeah, he's a, he's a he's a black belt under Jean Jacques, yeah. and Jean Jacques is just he's the just the best type of human being to be around he Good has, guy. oh he's an amazing person Good just uh, very kind very uh very confident just very relaxed but in terms of just jujitsu and just being a tough guy on the mat he could sit there and eat a sandwich and kick most of the right. ufc's ass on the mat and yeah. just no True. effort and he has half a hand you know he's missing yes. like half the yes. fingers it's yeah. amazing what he's able to do but um Eddie Bravo, I think, spent like an hour talking after a training. And the guy's like so charismatic when he's teaching, and you're just like, it's he, like a show. Talk. It's a he's, performance he's piece. Yes. I did a podcast with him, and it's one of the most fun podcasts I've ever done because Eddie is just, uh, he's, he's un, unbuttoned and unhinged, and he's the real deal. So I, there's a lot of talent out there in the world in so many fields, and certainly MMA has you know, given birth to a whole bunch of them. And I think we're going to see a lot. We'll see more Conor McGregor's in the years ahead. This, this is a sport that, uh, you know, it's the most primal sport of all. Horan used to say if you're at a boxing match or at a hockey uh, and, and a fight breaks out in the stands, you watch the fight in the stands. So that's what the UFC is, in a way, has always been about, and it still has that primal excitement to it. I think we're going to see a lot more uh, Conor McGregor's and Ronda Rousey's in the, in the years ahead. Oh, for sure. It, it can only go that way because the fighters, they, they they talk about unionizing and this sort of thing. And that's actually an interesting question. Um, do you think that's ever going to happen? Very tough to organize uh, unions among pro athletes in a single competing sport. Individuals, yeah, right? Very hard. I, There's been no history of it. I remember talking to somebody who said, well, we could make it, be, we could probably model it on what's been done with taxi cab drivers in certain cities. But you don't see the disparity of cab driver A and cab driver B as opposed to a guy who's fighting, you know, for Titan or victory as opposed to Conor McGregor. I mean, we're, you know, these seven figures and Two, you know, f- five figures. So, I mean, they, they, there's not, they, you can't put them in the same box. So, I, I would think it's going to be difficult, if not impossible. We haven't seen it as of yet. 
I feel like the 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 individuals that are getting into fighting, it's honestly at this moment, it's on them to find the coaches, to find the management staff, and it's not easy because a lot of them are working full time. Yeah, and the pay isn't great. You wind up having to pay out to your corner. You're going to pay them. They need to have somebody over there telling them, look. You got to work your personality muscle too. You, yeah. Charisma, you can learn it. You can learn damn near anything. You can get out in front of a microphone. You're going to learn it. You're going to do it until you can't. You know, you're going to do it until you're good at it or you don't. But if you're not out there, you're not picking up the stupid smartphone and making your YouTube videos and making. So, Conor McGregor's biggest thing with um, this last fight, he won the two titles. He's holding them up triumphant. He beat Eddie Alvarez, the Philadelphia guy. And he has his two belts now, right? He did he did it in uh, Cage Rage in the UK also when he was you know still in, living in Dublin. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he's still there somewhat now, but he has the two belts and he goes in the press conference and says, well, now the UFC has to come and call me. I want part ownership. He says all these different Mark Wahlberg and uh, Conan O'Brien, they all have a little piece of the UFC now, right? right. It's uh, the, what is it called? The WME uh, group? Yes. It's whatever it stands for. Right. It's, it's a group of shareholders that, that are celebrities. Yeah, yeah. M- many of them. I don't. I don't yeah. know the whole list. I, I, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he said, if they if they want me to leave my home and come and you know do something with you guys, you have to give me a call. You have to come to me, and you need to give me a piece of this thing. And uh, he said, in the process of preparing for this last fight and the last few fights, he's put out more content than the UFC has on the fight. So he's making the daily videos, the video blogs, the all kinds of here's me training, here's me trash talking, here's this, here's that, here's me on an airplane with Dana White doing doing the Conor McGregor stuff, look at me suit shopping, right? Just getting out there and putting himself out. And it's, wait a minute, if you're producing your own stuff, and I got one of these, I'm producing my own stuff, I can get myself over, you can get him. So the other fighters, they they really need to learn that. And if the UFC is... You know, teaching, good on them. That's great. They're saying, hey, sell yourself. Um, as long as you put the Reebok logo out there and as long as you use do this, don't do this, you got to have some guidelines. You can't be saying some ridiculousness. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, there's a code of contact, right. code, code of conduct, code of I'm conduct. sure. You're yeah. a professional. Conduct yourself as when you're representing right. the Ultimate Fighting Championship. But ultimately, it, while there's no union, you got a you got a smartphone. You got your guys back there. You're paying them your twenty percent minimum management fee, training, right. coaching. You got to live. You got to pay your bills. Sure. You ain't working at Starbucks or wherever. You ain't working at uh, Google. Mm-hmm. It's on them to kind of learn that. They have to put themselves over. They got to sell the fights. Mayweather sold his fights. Sure. Now, but you can't go and start the money team, can you? So it's uh, yeah. You know, while there's no union, it's 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 on these guys to go out there. Absolutely. And, yeah. Absolutely. It, it sucks. The fighter pay is always going to be something people complain about, but there's a lot of MMA fighters and even the boxers. Yeah. The top, top guys, they make a ton of money, but the lower end guys, they don't, don't. they That's don't. Right. You're, you're in Mexico, you're grinding, scratching and clawing, trying to make it. They ain't making a million dollars. They're, they're, they're praying to, to come here and to fight on Showtime, to fight on HBO, to fight on pay-per-view. Right. You know, it's, it's, it isn't just, you get into the business and you're famous. It isn't like you get on a TV show, you do a pilot and you're famous. There's so many guys on TV that aren't rich. That's right. And I don't think people have a, a very clear idea that fame doesn't mean rich. Fame isn't what you think it is. And being on TV doesn't mean you're going to be making a fortune. That's right. So that's right. I think having people in these fighters camps that are, uh, are that are able to align expectations and sort of set them up for success in terms of like this is what you need to know here's how you manage your money here's how you go out there and put yourself over here's how social media works and if you don't have those things down you can fight as much as you want to you can be a champion you can be the best guy i remember uh, one time talking to bob myrowitz about um, you know the different roles that are in mma what role you could do and what role you couldn't do and he once said, though, that he said that uh, I always avoided being a manager or uh, in the show business, he said, for the following reason. He said, you're going to get a call at 4.30 in the morning. Your talent is at the Malibu police station. They've been arrested for drunk driving or drugs or something. And you're going to have to go pick up their dog first and pick them up. He said, it's a full-time job. He said, and it's, you're basically babysitting 
a, a personality that at times you want to hit him, smack him in the back of the head. So he did, he said, I never wanted to do that. On the other hand, if anybody wants to find a great young talent and help to do what you just suggested, help him to organize his life, show him how to take care of his money, show him how to build a persona that can be sold to help him sell his fights. There's a great job to be in doing that. And, you know, you could develop a stable of people doing that. I myself have never been drawn to that. No. Although I really did a good job in the role that I had as booker and matchmaker. But I was not a manager. And my job stopped at that door. So uh, it was different. But I respect the guys that have done it. Over the years, I've seen some guys come and go early on. Um, a name that is now gone is Robert De Persia. It was an attorney who early on brought a lot of the wrestlers in. In fact, John McCarthy tells a story in uh, Let's Get It On that one time De Persia represented both guys that were facing each other in the octagon. And McCarthy said, I think that was one of the few times that a fight was fixed. We had nothing to do with it, but the manager represented both fighters. So, uh, you know, some of those guys are gone. And uh, some, uh, you know, have stayed and there's still some people around. My good friend Darren Harvey was instrumental in bringing Ronda Rousey along. And um, in fact, the last time I talked to Darren, there was still some legal issues between him and Ronda that he couldn't mm -hmm. talk to me about. Sure. But he had invested quite a few dollars. Um, he had an interesting career himself because he had brought Boss Rudin and Lucia Riker along. Wow. as talent and for a year he was my partner in a company called six guns entertainment i had five hundred thousand dollars seed capital from lee iacocca to see if in 2008 an alternative could be created to the ufc and at the end of 2008 the beginning of 2009 the greatest recession in my lifetime hit and a lot of investment money dried up so nothing quite came out of the two the six guns entertainment but Boss Boone was a member of that group. Um, Darren Harvey, Federico Lapenda, um, Scott Niederlander of the famous Niederlander family that owns the Winter Garden Theater in New York and uh, the big uh, major theater on, in, in Hollywood uh, was a member. And uh, Vic Asad, Lee Iacocca, son in law. Those were the six guns. That's a stable. That's that was a, a stable. That's a hell of a stable. So in 2008. You guys were looking to compete. With we were looking to compete. And then at the time, we would look and we thought it would only take $25 million to get back into the game. And we, as I said, with the recession hitting, we found out that that was a, a lot of money to raise at that point. If you would ask me that question five years later, I would tell you that it would be $100 million uh, poker, ante to get into the game. I don't know what it would be now. Because the UFC has, you know, become the WWE. They've become an incredible, tremendous entity representing the, the majority of where the sport is at. And they recently, as you know, in July of this year, sold for a reputed $4 billion <laughs> with a B. So uh, if anybody was thinking of trying to create a competitor to the UFC today, the ante to get into that game, it would be an, 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 un, an obscene number. And, 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 and even then, it would be an enormous risk. It's, it's $4 billion is the ante. It might be. That made the ante. Well, We're very close to it. I... Um... I just heard very recently their most uh, their New Year's show, I believe, just fell out. So um, DC is injured, mm. so they don't have a main event anymore for the mm. big New Year show. Mm. Or, you know, the the one the end of the yes. year. Yes. So it's um, it's up in the air. They're trying to get George St. Pierre to replace uh, mm. the UFC 200 event. They had to scrap that because yep. of uh, Connor and uh, you know, I guess Diaz not able to come together on terms right. or whatever the hell happened. Um, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't on the phone. Yeah, I wasn't invited. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they didn't call me. I wasn't. I wasn't. I didn't get the press uh, release on that one. But then they bring in uh, who was a Brock Lesnar. It's like the the last gasp. And then everybody made a big deal because there were a few, there were a few failed tests because at first they had John Jones in DC and yes. there was there was a failed test there. Um, and <clears throat> Lesnar's failed test wasn't brought up until after the fact, but they right. knew and. Um, and now there's a lawsuit with Mark Hunt. Yeah, there so is. So it's interesting. There is. Um, and I, I feel for him. I do. He did go on record and saying, I know he's juiced to the gills. I'm going to kick his ass anyway on every radio station that would book him right. beforehand. And that doesn't, that's like, yeah, that's just, you know, trash talk, whatever. But if you're bringing lawyers, so is the other side. 
And that's going to matter yeah. substantially, yeah. I think. Um, he admitted he knew. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's so, yeah. You, you just yeah. said it's fine. Right. There's whatever. Um, but you know, it's. I, I feel like even Lesnar, whether he knew or not, I think the amount of money he got and what was disclosed, I I'm sure he got paid plenty of money to be able to do what he did. To be able to cross out from Vin- Vince McMahon, who's very protective of his guys working both things. Sure. And Dana White, who has always wanted to make space between the two entities, but um, by the way, years ago, uh, uh, I had reached out to um, to uh, I'm trying to think of the wrestling promoter back in the day, and uh, he had Menga, um, and I wanted Menga, and I couldn't get him. I heard from from other wrestlers that. Uh, that he really could fight. Oh, is he the big Samoan guy? Yeah, big Samoan guy. Oh. But uh, I'm trying to think of the wrestling promoter whose name right is on the tip of my tongue. Bischoff? Eric Bischoff. And Bischoff and I got on the phone once and I couldn't do anything with it. But I had reached out and was trying to make a, a bridge and an offering. So I was interested early on in, in creating that linkage between the WWE and I brought Halme in as a wrestler. So I, I my, my door was always open to that. But I remember talking to Bischoff on one or two occasions, I wanted Menga because I was told that, like Tank Abbott, he, that everyone was really afraid of him outside the ring. Yeah, he was. He was, uh, he was a tough boy, and people, you know, really feared him. So I wanted to bring him in, but uh, I, I think that you know, if I was still around, I'd be. I would have been one of the first guys to bring a Brock Lesnar in. I think I understand the linkage to that. You know, Res- Lesnar, as you know, has legitimate wrestling credentials, and oh. Yes. To say the least. So, Absolutely. you know, you, you can't just argue he's just a pro wrestler. So, uh, you know, I, maybe CM Punk is a different issue. But I think that, again, as you and I have been talking about today, this is sports entertainment. And once you recognize it's sports entertainment, then you have to look at this from an entertainment standpoint and say, what can we do to make the fans happy? Yeah, I think the the booking of CM Punk, you know, everybody this has beaten this to death. He, he probably should have started a smaller stage with more experience and coming mm-hmm. off a of back surgery right before it. And that they even mentioned the back surgery in the, you know, the 365 videos they they have leading up to it. You're already, you're already getting in the back of your head like this guy's losing. Mm-hmm. For sure he's losing. Yeah. You know, now I feel great. I had back surgery. Now I can train 100% even though I've only ever trained maximum two years. And I've been doing this other thing that's beat the crap out of my body worse than if I were doing MMA the whole time yeah. with concussions included. Right. So th- that that came out the way it did, not surprised. I think it's ballsy as hell he went and did it. And I, for, for the business sense, yeah, you book that guy. Guy's got millions of fans. He wants to do it. Stick him in there. He loses, he loses. As, I would have done as, it. As long as he doesn't die in there, we're good. I would have done it. I wouldn't make it the main event. Mm-hmm. But, right, but it, I'd make it a side show that, that has its value. Or you make it the main event on like a Fox show. Right. Because then the whole world sees it. Exactly. And then your sponsors, you're going to make money. It's a long game. I mean, sure. it doesn't have to be pay-per-view. Is right. I wouldn't, you got to be careful booking those pay-per-views. You never know what's going to happen, right? And you better have your alternates like ready to go. You, not everybody's going to have a Mark Schultz right there willing to take 50 grand. Interestingly enough, when you look at uh, what we did in the old days, about 78% of our revenue was pay-per-view. Today it's down to 55 is the total revenue sure. because they have other revenue streams that have done very well. Gate. Like merchandise. Games, merchandise, flight pass, et cetera. All kinds of uh, – there's toys. Yes. There's little action figures of these guys. No, it's insane. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a whole business. Um, it's a whole industry now. Um, yeah. This show is an extension of what you did yeah. in 94. Me training every day for the last 12 years in jiu-jitsu is an extension of yep. what you you showing up at the Gracie Academy and walking out with Piranha and right. <laughs> 15,000, 20,000 mailers for, uh, for Horians uh, for the Gracie Academy yeah. and uh, Torrance. It all sort of circles back and – Man, we've uh we've been on for two hours. Um, what was the only thing I wanted to? Oh, that's right. You mentioned Eric Bischoff, and then it's funny you wound up working. You were a, you know kind of a bigwig over at Mandalay for a number of years. Yes. He, uh, I, I recall, he was trying to get backing from Mandalay to buy WCW before Vince McMahon was able to soak it up. So it was funny that he was he he kept the number in the Rolodex after Ming uh, turned him down. Yes. Or he, yeah, we had. Uh, uh, um, Russell Neftal, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the actor that was in um, The Wonder Years. 
uh, was very Jason Hervey, Jason Hervey, yeah. and uh, Eric Bischoff. And I had an office right next to uh, right next to uh, Howie Newchow, who is now an agent over at CAA. And Howie at the time was in charge of Mandalay Baseball. Mandalay Baseball owned a bunch of minor league teams in towns like Dayton, along with partner Magic Irvin Magic Johnson. Okay. And they were one of the most profitable divisions in Mandalay Entertainment. Um, and uh, I remember that uh, I had developed a, a TV show with Magic at one point called M-A-G-I-C, Making a Great Inner City, which was basically the accomplice, uh, uh, or the apprentice, excuse me, in the ghetto. Cool. And it was hosted by Irvin Magic Johnson. Uh, I had a show called Black and Blue that I had developed, which starred the uh, Edwin O. Reischauer, who had been as a, the old man was the ambassador to Japan. His son was a devoted martial arts devotee, and we were going to send him around the country to get his butt kicked by going into schools and basically challenging them and saying, I heard you guys aren't really the real deal. And I, you know, it was called Black and Blue. And I had a show called King of the Streets. It was a tuna car reality show hosted by um, uh, uh, the great Brazilian race car driver who won oh massa no oh, i no i can't think of it he won the Let's indianapolis see. three times and he won dancing with the stars the fifth season um I, i'll think of it in a minute but he was going to be the host of the show and i was trying to sell that to fox at the time when they had spun off the speed channel and it, it had been a separate channel and now they simply brought it in a fox um i can't think of the name of the great race car driver who won three indianapolis 500s I'd uh, I'd look it up on my, uh, <laughs> my, right. my idiot box over there, but it's it seems to be busy right now. That's fine, man. So yeah, I was uh, yeah I was with uh, uh, that crowd over at the Mandalay Entertainment, and uh, we developed a number of shows when I was there. Yeah, I saw some it. sold, some didn't. That's kind of how it goes. I'm seeing. Yes, so there's a there's a there's a ton of ideas, a ton of pilots, and um, not every one of them's the UFC. That's true. But <clears> um, when it is. Um, there are a million reasons why it's a really good idea, and then eventually four billion more. But um, yeah, that it wasn't it wasn't certain that that was going to be a four million dollar thing. That that almost went up in flames a number of times. Are you surprised that it made it? Yeah, that it's what it is today. No, that it, that it finally sold for four billion. <laughs> um, if I want to be candid on the subject, I, I saw it going one of two ways, mm -hmm. this way or um, some sort of uh, one of those class action suits actually catching ground and ah. some, some jail time. Oh, wow. Really? I'm, it's a it's a it's a it's a boxing promoter from Boston with casino owners doing business in the fight promotion. And you're talking billions of dollars. Yeah. At some point, I just you I, didn't I, I, I just thought someone would uncover something and it just really yeah huh. there's been something there's, that would, would have sunk it because it would have been negative publicity maybe there's yeah. well there, there's there's all these fighters unions and all the concussion talk yeah and i see how the nfl is able to deal with it but the nfl has a, it has the means to deal with it yeah huh I, I i either saw a sale or just the lawsuits putting it under or putting one of these other ones huh. in front of it that's why i always i never liked the name bellator for uh the mma thing huh It, here, uh, Remember that spot out as a Hispanic uh, MMA originally, didn't it? Bellator. It, I think so. Yeah. It was the uh, th so. Here's the thing with the name Bellator. We know what it is because we took history classes. However, the average person out there doesn't know what a Bellator is, right. and they get about what nine hundred thousand views per event on these spike shows they, because they have the weekly program yes. and they do pay per views. I was at the event in San Jose just recently. I was backstage at the weigh-ins. Doing the whole thing, and you know they had a they had a decent turnout. It, they, there wasn't much advertising in, that I saw. Coker did better with those uh, celebrity events where you know you've got Dad of Five Thousand fighting Kimbo Slice or Ken Shamrock fighting Hoist Gracie. Just don't make it the main event, right? You have those. Yeah, there's a place for legends on the card. Yeah, but the I think that really the the big picture is like you're trying to build your your uh, the guys that are going to be there. Yeah. The yeah. uh, build Mike Chandler's yeah. build the uh, the the Josh Thompsons or whoever your stars yeah. are that are going to be there for the long haul. Yeah, the Benson Hendersons. The, 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 the Ben Askrens. 
yeah, if they can get him. He's yeah. he's in Asia fighting yeah. now, but I just feel like um, you, you got to take those legends fights and some of those man David and Goliath or they yeah. they, they they call them freak shows. I don't like that name because some of the, some of these guys are legit athletes and stuff. Yeah. They got Kimbo Slice Junior fighting, right. for example. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought the name should be more indicative of what the product is. If if I was uh, uh, in the business of marketing something that was an MMA product that was on Spike TV and it was owned in part by Viacom, I'd probably call it MMA on Spike TV. I'm just saying. Because the, the, the name MMA, that three-letter abbreviation, like most sports in the world that we take seriously, like FIFA, yes. NFL, um, the, well, UFC, uh, MLB, NFL, NHL, NBA. Right. Well, the MMA, that's not taken. And if anything were to happen where UFC would just have a fall from grace or they were sell or something, something happened, I'd want to be the guy that had the MMA show. And if I was on Spike TV, I'd call it MMA and Spike TV. That's, that's a pretty clever. I think you're right about that. I just, I just, I don't know what a Bellator is. Yeah. It's and like, I, what does it mean? I, I went to college. Yeah. But you got a lot of fans out there that they're, if they're flipping through and you're trying to bring in the casual fans. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. And when you start winning those guys over, so when, if someone like Conor McGregor one day says, you know what, I'm just going to go fight for whoever I want to, because he seems like he's close to just not caring. And if anyone could do it, it would be him. Because right now you don't have the promoter and the, uh, the sanctioning body being the same thing in boxing. Right. There's how many are there yeah. in the UFC? There's one. And they All you that. need is a state to sanction it and a promoter to come up with enough money and you could do a show with uh, Conor McGregor. Well, he's generating the kind of numbers yeah. where he might actually be able to pull something sure. like that. Yeah. I'm just saying I'd call it something else. That's I think you're right. I, I, I'm a big fan of Scott. Um, ah. Elio Castro Nuevas. That's the Brazilian. Three-time winner of the Indianapolis 500 and winner of the season five Dancing with the Stars. Elio Castro Nuevas, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. I used to call him that because he would climb up on the fencing whenever he won. He would jump up and wave at the crowd. Make sure there's no electric fence up there. That would be a terrible yeah, really. Move. But good-looking kid, and he was going to be my host of uh, King of the Streets, a drag racing reality show uh, based on tuna cars. It's so interesting, huh? That, I mean, with the, the popularity of all the Fast and Furious stuff, yes, that would have been perfect. that's what it was based on. There yeah. you go. Well, we've been at it two hours and 20 minutes, Mr. Davey. <laughs> Good. Uh, let's uh, let's get in some plugs. I, okay. I know the book is this legal? Is available on um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, the Fanatics bookstore, the official UFC bookstore has them. Um, you can also go to is this legal the book dot com for information that we couldn't even fit in the book because there was so much of it, like pictures of the original octagon, alternative drawings, is on that website, and. Um, the book has been optioned on April 1st, 2015 by Legacy Entertainment Partners to be a film. They have developed a script with three writers and over the last 11 months, and they're in the process of raising money and attracting talent, and hopefully you'll have it in front of the uh, cameras next year in the state of Georgia, which has a very favorable tax environment for films these days. Uh, yeah, they filmed The Walking Dead there, actually. That's correct. So it's and Tyler Perry has a movie studio right there in Atlanta. And they've already spoken to uh, the University of Georgia in Athens has a stadium which will double for McNichols Arena, which was the location of the UFC 1 in Denver, Colorado, November 12th, 1993, a long time ago. That's a hell of a stunt double. It's like a large-scale stunt double yes, right it there, is. right? it is. All right. Well, Art, I'd like to thank you uh, for all your contribution to, uh, well, everything I'm doing right now, basically, um, and for coming on and spending some time. I really appreciate it. And um, guys, buy his book. And it should be an audio book, too. You got the voice. I should probably do an audio book at some point. I got to keep talking to my publisher about that. Absolutely. If you can go two hours and 20 minutes with me, I know your book's way more interesting than anything <laughs> I could ask you. So uh, thank you for your time. And um, buy the book. Is this legal? Um, UFC one creator, founder, and um, if you're into jujitsu or MMA, it's his fault. So blame him. Thanks thank for you coming. very much, Glenn. Thank, thank you.